the longest day, right? Correct. Good evening, good afternoon, good night, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to Movie Watch Live. Tonight we're going to be doing the incredible three hour long epic movie version of the events of D Day, which was the 6th of June, 1944, the Allied invasion of Europe. Uh, a momentous occasion in European and world history, one of the defining moments of the 20th century. Joining me tonight are both Aldous and Carl. Uh, good evening, Carl. How are you doing? Doing great, Pete. How are you this evening? I'm very well, thank you. I've had some late night crumpet, and um, in this instance, I mean the food version. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and I've got all my beers and everything ready to go here. Um, any thoughts about tonight's movie? Um, yeah, this is actually one of my favorite movies. Uh, I first saw this film when I was a kid, watched it with my dad, and whenever it's on TV, he always calls me and goes, hey, it's on, you know, Turner Classic Movies, and you know, <laughs> watch it. So yeah, um, it's you know, based off a book, and which is basically just a compilation of different experiences of different soldiers from all over uh, the battlefield that day, and just kind of takes us through um, as the average soldier goes about his day. On the, yeah. the possibly one of the most important days of the 20th century. Absolutely, yeah. I love the ducky drama style of this, and also all this. Good evening, all this. How are we doing, Pete? Not so bad. How are you? I've got a a wide selection of American lagers and British ESBs next to me. Ooh, that sounds good. And I'm uh, I'm currently burning some fine American tobacco. Very in nice. Station of this uh, wonderful movie. Um, as Carl alluded to. Um, the Longest Day was written by Cornelius Ryan. Cornelius Ryan yeah. also wrote um, one of my other favorite World War II books, A Bridge Too Far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we, we, which was made into a movie as well. Was the um, was that the was that the basis of the movie that uh, was produced? I believe the, so. Yeah. Um, and any thoughts on tonight's movie? It's it's a classic. It's uh, it's one I haven't seen more than maybe a half a dozen times. Um, I, I was raised in a house that tend to watch, uh, we watched more of the Pacific theater yeah. uh, grand films from Hollywood rather than the European theater. Um, just because uh, two of our, two of my great uncles passed in uh, on D-Day. And uh, yeah. it was uh, just something that was kind of not talked about too much in the family, mm. so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this is it. It's a very, <clears throat> it's very close to a lot of people's hearts and uh, you know, uh, the Allied troops made a huge sacrifice that day, and indeed the American troops made, I think, the biggest sacrifice on that day uh, with, uh, uh, I believe it was Omaha Beach, uh, where, the way that went down. Um, so we're going to start the movie, and for anybody who's watching either live or recorded, what we normally do is count down from three to one, and then I say go, and on the uh, count of go, you would just start the movie. Me, uh, Carl, and Aldous... Uh, are all watching the uh, Amazon Prime version, which is available to rent. I think it's about three dollars, three or four dollars to rent. Uh, about two pounds fifty if you're in uh, if you're in Britain. Um, so uh, we'll start the ball rolling. So uh, without further ado, um, and even the even Carl's war dogs agree. <laughs> even they're getting excited about it. Yay! <laughs> so um, ready. So three. Two, one, go. So, I think uh, my PC is already booming things up a bit here. No, I'm going pretty good. I'm just trying to get these dogs to shut the hell up. Uh, yeah. But here we go. We've got the helmet on the screen right now with the iconic opening. Yeah. I think mine's played up a little bit. Yeah. So the um, the scene at the start here with the helmet, the uh, GI's helmet on the beach, and in the background you uh, you hear the drum beat, which is the um, theme from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, because. Uh, that was the most code for V, I believe, V for victory. Uh, that's correct. 
And here now, we see. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, now this is uh, some sort of secret agent being chased down by some SS men here. Yeah. They, this prelude they, to the invasion. Exactly, and you've got the typical sort of portrayal of the Nazi officer, or the suave way he just doesn't care less about who was just shot and uh, slips back into his top of the range Mercedes uh, officer's right. car. Now the uh, the German soldier on on the donkey there, uh, you may remember him. He played uh, Goldfinger in. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. I was trying to remember who he, where I'd seen him before. Gert Fröser yeah, is his yeah. name. I was, I was watching it earlier, and I was, take take a look at that. What a handsome sight! The pride of the Third Reich. He's got <laughs> yeah, his old stock foot footage, right? Or uh, old documentary footage, intermixed. Yeah, it does. It it has actual footage from. So yeah, so this is. The goose stepping morons, as Sean Connery called them, yeah. <laughs> in um, yeah, Last Crusade. I'll I'll say now, you'll not get any sympathy from me <laughs> from the Germans throughout this movie. <laughs> so, so yeah, the very French, fit, the French part on the bicycle good. is pretty nice. Yeah. So this is like a quick montage, to use a French word, of what it was like under German occupation five years of this um oh and here is the incredible um arena denik so there's a cast of stars in this movie um very quickly running down through them john wayne kenneth moore richard todd robert mitchum richard burton steve forrest sean connery henry fonda red buttons peter lawford eddie albert Jeffrey Hunter, Stuart Whitman, Tom Tryon, Rod Steiger, Leo Glenn, Gerd Frosser, we've mentioned, Irina Demick, uh, Kurt Jurgens, George Siegel, Robert Wagner, uh, or Wagner, Paul Anker, and Arletti. So a lot of stars in this movie. So in other words, if you ever get stuck in a uh, game of uh, uh, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, this is a great film to get back to the stars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we're seeing the uh, the Roman style stuff that the Germans like to use on their uniforms and for certain officers as well. Um, uh, you see the the gorget on the uh, the the field gendarme, arm, the, uh, the the field police guy. Uh, that's that's a holdover from the uh, Prussians. Mm. Mm. And so this entire time, both the British and the American intelligence services were active in France, um, training units. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah you had well, the OSS. I'm sorry, go ahead. All this. I was just going to say, yeah, the the OSS and MI6, MI5 had uh, numerous assets that were dropped <clears throat> periodically for months um, prior to the invasion to organize and communicate with the resistance. Mm. And here we see this huge German gun emplacement here. I mean, that looks like at least a 60-pound gun. Is that right? Or That's part of the Atlantic Wall right there, right? The, yeah. uh, the field defense or the coastal defenses of, uh, of uh, occupied France. Exactly. So and we're seeing... Pete, Pete, we got to get you corrected on your, uh, your English here because uh, <laughs> guns are measured in their bore diameter, not in their poundage. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> only... Only you crazy Brits do that. Yeah. <laughs> and we're, uh, we're seeing a, a gallery of very famous uh, German generals here and uh, supervising the construction of the Atlantic Wall. I think people forget the, the sort of length of time that this film documents uh, up to the actual Allied invasion. Yeah, in some spots, it basically goes hour by hour. So, I mean, we're talking a fairly tight amount of space here. Mm. Uh, but this is. Um, that's yeah, Field Marshal Irvin Rommel, played by Werner Hintz. Yeah, what, what, Rommel, what, committed suicide in November 1944, something like that? Yeah, wasn't he removed from command? <clears throat> yes, he was removed from command following uh, his involvement in the assassination attempt. Yeah, he got, he got caught up in uh, in Operation Valkyrie. Yeah. Yes. In the maybe not directly involved, but in the fallout. So was it? And there's so, uh, 
there's some it was it was for suicide um to retain honor for his family um there's some supposition that um the events preceding d-day or preceding and immediately following d-day mm. um led rommel to his uh to the uh his inclusion in the in uh, the attempt yeah he was, very, he was very disgusted with how uh how von runstedt and him were treated yeah yeah and i mean was it was it suicide or could rommel have been murdered well, he was going to be murdered. It was he. Yeah. He committed suicide. I mean, I suppose anything's possible because we weren't there. But yeah. So now I've got to the. I'm to give anybody a timestamp. I'm six minutes twenty nine seconds in. Uh, I might be a little bit ahead because I had a bit of a boomer moment starting the thing. You're off. a little bit behind, buddy. Yeah. Uh, what do you got, Aldous? I'm um, at. Uh, I'm a little ahead of you guys. I'm at seven, so I'm just. I'm, gonna seven too, I'm just going to go to seven. Okay. I'm at seven now as well. So we're in German high command here in the um, control room, and we've got Lieutenant Colonel Helmut Meyer, and uh, that's just the model of the guy they use for um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> just, just pretty much is, isn't it? Yeah. Now I know I know Hugo Boss designed the SS uniforms. So he I was going to say, yeah, well. yeah, the the whole idea of having the best uniforms around. But it's the now well established joke of um, when they look at the uniforms and they see the little skulls and they go, um, "Are we are we the baddies? <laughs> <laughs> are we the baddies? Yeah, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> imagine your Hugo Boss nineteen. 34 or something like that you're you're asked to design uh uniforms for the the ss <laughs> and you're asked so what do you want to go for you know and you yeah. come up with skulls exactly <laughs> what's the message there <laughs> yeah. well and the the interesting right. analogy of that that actually came up um in january of this year was the creator of punisher um expressed his displeasure in u.s special forces utilizing the punisher mm -hmm. skull on their designs and his reference was some of those exact points well the thing is the the the, the thing for the skull is the 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 totem comp the skull of the uh ss wear on the caps that actually goes back to the uh the hussar units of the napoleonic era right uh, they would wear those badges on their caps so i mean the historical basis is um at least originates with the hussar units yeah. right and a lot of that was done <coughs> following <coughs> excuse me Following World War One, um, the the reunified Germany, and uh, one of the things the Nazis really tried to do was harken back to uh, all of their the great history of the Prussian military and the German states, and so you see that reinforced in all of their uniforms as a sense of historical pride. Mm -hmm. They're trying to build up the country that was so devastated from uh, the end of World War One. Mm. Right, it's, it's, it's propaganda true. in a different form. It's it's. Um, Pulling upon your mythology, basically. Yeah, and the Nazis are very clean, keen to do that because they <clears throat> they wanted to return to some fabled well, who's, time. Who's on the screen right there, because he's got a uh, uh, a gold uh, blue Max on as well. Who the hell is that? Yeah, this I is Max. Yeah, so this is Field Marshal uh, Erwin Rommel talking to uh, Field Marshal Gert von. Runstedt. Oh, Runstedt. Okay. Yep. Runstedt won the blue match. Was right? a yeah. He was a World War One ace. England, oh, one of the one one oh eight Allied camps. So, were most of the American soldiers involved in Operation Overlord? Were the, most of them uh, like Greenhorns? Um, a lot of them would have been. Some of them were veterans from North Africa campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a lot of them would have been greenhorns. Mm -hmm. But we also have to remember there is a substantial. We're in uh, leading up to June of '44. There is a substantial Allied presence in uh, southern Italy, slowly marching up the coast, yeah, up into the mountains. Yeah, um, you've got the majority of the. I believe it was the majority of the Ranger uh, battalions were located in Italy. The Tenth Mountain was located in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of air air assets were located in mm -hmm. Italy. It mm -hmm. was uh, that was it was a major front that's often forgotten. And uh, I mean, you had a lot of uh, a lot of very serious engagements. The most famous, probably, mm -hmm. being Casino, um, in and, the Italian and, theater. 
I think this is Mike Anger's granddad uh, serving the food here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, a very young Robert Wagner. Pre Nelly Wood. Yeah. Um, wow, he's so young, I didn't even recognize him at first. It was his voice. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, sorry, go ahead. As you say, Britain looks so nice. Yeah, <laughs> we have no shortage of water. <laughs> Uh, for anybody who wants to know English accents, the guy on the left has a Yorkshire accent. The bloke on the right is a Cockney. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, most of the British troops would have been North African vets, um, purely because the fact we'd run out of people by the stage. <laughs> well, you'd also have a lot of vets from the BEF. Yeah. We're going to see, we're probably going to start seeing uh, the Donald Duck tank soon and things like that, I imagine. Um, but it's just, just the scale, the scale of the invasion. We're seeing the, the size of the camps and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the sheer manpower and logistics that went into this. Right. I mean, you would have, like, here you have guys that are, there's not even enough room for them in camps already stationed aboard ships. Uh, ready to disembark because at this point they don't even know if the invasion is happening right they're uh, yeah basically on a you know checking the weather every hour to see when the break's going to come and they're going to go when that break comes so Got roddy mcdowell there so I, I believe uh roddy mcdowell was only was in this movie because he was angry at how long cleopatra was taking to being filmed <laughs> right. and he just wanted he, and he wanted to do something so they gave him a, like a side role that he could do while he was waiting for Cleopatra to be finished Cleopatra of course being a monumental epic that was both epic in scope and epic in its absolute failure <laughs> right yeah definitely this is uh you know, this is the era where the American troops had to put up with cold weather and warm beer. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of what you really want. <laughs> um, but I mean, there was the, the, you can see how, I mean, oh, here is the man, John Wayne. Airborne. Benjamin Van der Vogt. And for uh, for all of you in Europe that are listening, that is uh, the only American that is ever allowed to maintain a title of nobility because that's the Duke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, for every American watching. This is the seal of approval, isn't it? Once John Wayne's on there. The, you, you can't get, I mean, outside of maybe John Wayne holding a plate of bacon with uh, a bottle of Jack next to a motorcycle <laughs> wearing a cowboy hat, you don't get much more American yeah, than that. That's it, like. <laughs> you know, and this also, this entire cast, too, it harkens back to a different era of Hollywood. Um, mm. a, a lot of the men that you're seeing in the background a lot of them were vets. Um, mm -hmm. As the movie goes on, there, some of the scenes are actually uh, vets doing exactly what they did on D-Day, um, yeah, yeah. especially with the Point de Hoc scenes. Exactly. So it's, yeah. a, it's a different era of Hollywood. It was This is a celebration of the accomplishments of... Wow. of I was just reading about the Vandervoort's uh, bio a little bit. He did some pretty interesting stuff in, during Operation Market Garden after, the, after this battle. Yeah, at uh, the I think everybody involved in this up uh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, two two distinguished service crosses, which is as anyone who knows really? it, yeah, just below the Medal of Honor. Wow. Some pretty heavy hitters in, in this campaign, really. I mean this you know, this was the, the last year of the war in Europe. <clears throat> um just obviously we've got Robert 
uh, Mitchum on the screen there. Now, Jeremy. one of my favorite, yeah, he's one of my favorite actors, to be honest. If you talk about American actors. Oh, dude, you ever, you ever want to watch a scary movie, watch uh, Night of the Hunter. Yeah. With him. That's creepy as hell. Yeah. I believe uh, Vanderbilt too um, expressed in a biography or a book regarding this movie that he was a little miffed that they had John Wayne playing him because I believe he was only like twenty-seven, maybe thirty-seven yeah. when uh, this event, when D Day, act so, yeah, when, when it actually happened, and yeah, um, yeah. You know, John Wayne's almost like yeah, he was yeah, pretty yeah, young. So, yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe John wanted to play that part. You know, well, it's it's a it's Hollywood, man. You got to shoehorn. Yeah, this is shoehorn it. guys in. There's always in every unit. There's always some guy like this, isn't it? Hey, come on, give me give me another. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> let me yeah, fifty bucks, money. Twenty-seven on D-Day. <laughs> yeah, so you so fifty dollars in now, uh, 1944 is the equivalent to what now? Right. Oh, probably about. I would say at least a th maybe five hundred dollars at least. Um, the, like it's fifty dollars in nineteen forty-four with adjusted for inflation would be about seven hundred dollars in today's purchasing power. Yeah, and now for you know to to help you understand what the British stereotype is of the Americans, it comes from this era because at the time Britain was. Uh, not occupied, but um, hosting a massive American army. So this race memory ha has had led left a you know an indelible mark on the consciousness of Britain. So most of the American stereotypes come from this era. Um, you know, I mean, things are different now with the internet. You know, where it's a much smaller world but if you want to know where a lot of the american stereotypes that british people hold come from it's from this era mm -hmm. you know uh the uh, what is it overpaid over sexed and over here yeah pretty much <laughs> but i mean i think it worked remarkably well you know i don't think uh i don't think any other I think the, the common language helped, obviously, but I don't think any other nation could have could have worked. Two nations could have worked together so well, you know. Yeah, I mean, it uh, wasn't wasn't perfect. Yeah, there's, uh, a, there's a shared heritage. <laughs> there's a shared language. There's yeah, there's close ties going all the way back. Well, I said on the the screenshot for the. Uh, for the stream, I picked. A, I found a, a quote by Susan Eisenhower: "The special relationship between the United States of America and Great Britain was cemented on the beaches of Normandy. On both sides of the Atlantic, we will be forever indebted to the veterans of the Allied Expeditionary Force, who fought to protect our freedom, and we need to ensure their story is not forgotten." So that's the words of Susan Eisenhower. So I think this was one of the, you know, one of the great moments that brought the two countries much closer right. together. Absolutely. And so now we're just going through. We're meeting all the little minor players in the in the in the film, and we're seeing what they're doing before the uh, invasion. Then we're going to go through and see what they do during. Yeah, so we get to see the personal stories. So this guy's faith here. And he's reflecting on what's gonna happen. And this is the and these guys were really between nineteen and twenty five on average, weren't they? That the average age was about mid twenties, early twenties. Yeah, that's that's right. Well most of the <laughs> you know, and, uh, off before the before the stream, we were kind of talking about uh, you know elite units and training, and uh, the airborne were very very well trained. They were very highly um, not not elite, but very definitely highly trained, highly drilled, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, they were th they were thrown into the mix because of what they uh, what they could do, what they were trained to do, and it's uh, the result was uh, was terrible was terrible. 
for what happened. They paid a huge price for that. Yeah, and was it you or Morg that was saying that I thought it just wasn't going to work? Yeah, actually, uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember if it's. I think it is in this film. Ike actually visited the the airborne units on the tarmac before they took off. Yeah. Um, because he he wanted to see the men that he assumed he was sending to their death. He assumed that most of none of them would ever return. And uh, Richard Burton just graced my screen. Yes, flight officer David Campbell, <laughs> the greatest. <And> uh, <laughs> I am I am ever in search of a scene or a movie where Richard Burton. It, does not have alcohol within three feet of him. Yeah. The other guy beside him is a really good actor. He often worked with Richard. Donald Houston is behind him there. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, Richard Burton plays a burnt-out RAF pilot who's just had about enough of uh, five years of fighting Nazis. <laughs> I think this expresses the... This is the filmmakers trying to show at this point that Britain was just almost screwed by this stage. We've been fighting for, you know, five years. And well, I mean, you got to look at it like well, this. Britain. How tired is the RAF at this point? Because the, you've just you've fought the Battle of Britain. Then they've been flying sorties over over the mainland for some time now. I mean, these guys have got to be at their wit's end, you know. Yeah, there was not really much leave. Um. Well, Burton just mentioned too um, that uh, they were over Canalis. Canalis is a port city that was <laughs> one of the cities that the Germans assumed would be the primary uh, direction of attack, and um, they were doing a lot of feints over a lot of the different areas where they were trying to make the Germans think with bombing runs and such. So these guys would have been flying fighter cover for some of those bombers, and they mentioned they lost a friend, um, one of their fellow airmen, who was shot down and his chute didn't open. But that's yeah. that's why they're they're referencing that it's the <clears throat> it's not a throwaway line, but it's it's referencing what was happening, yeah. And for any any clever people in the background, you can hear um, the guy on the piano is actually playing the theme tune to the movie, um, subtly in the background. That's right. And to hit on Aldous's point, uh, you have to remember the attrition rate in the RAF was incredibly high, so yeah. all these guys are seeing. You go out on a mission, and odds are at least one one of your friends or someone you know is not coming back. So by the time you get to 1944, these guys that are that are still there from the beginning are very few and far between. Lost yeah. everybody. So yeah, it's I mean, also it, important to know that because of that attrition, uh, the RAF had Polish units from Free Poles yeah, that made it yeah. back to England. Yeah. <clears throat> there were Frenchmen that were flying. There were uh, there were Norwegians. There were Danes. Um, anybody from mainland Europe that made it to England was helping in some way for the Allied cause. Yeah, um, hundreds of hundreds of Canadians that had come over, even some Americans that prior to America's uh, entrance mm. into the war had come over, and I believe there was a handful of them that actually stayed in the RIF. Yeah, um, no, even after America's entrance into the war. Thank God for the English Channel, <laughs> uh, because the Nazis did try to. Uh, um, plan an invasion of Britain. It was Operation Sea Lion, wasn't it? Yes, they actually had. Uh, there's two Operation Sea Lions that were planned. One was Sea Lion 41, which was nixed because of Barbarossa, and the second one was Sea uh, Lion 43, which was nixed by uh, the invasion of, by Operation Torch. Actually, Operation mm -hmm. Torch's uh, drop in North Africa reallocated uh, Nazi assets, and they uh, they nixed the second invasion. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, by, by Sea Lion 43 was pretty much just a paper operation. There was no chance they could have mobilized enough. They were neck deep into a quagmire already in mm. Russia <clears throat> and couldn't afford the resources. Yeah. <clears throat> and even there's, uh, there's some argument by, um, by a lot of people that the, uh, the entire delay, the Allies were intentionally delaying D-Day to, um, by some members of Allied High Council were anticipating that the Soviet Union was going to be a problem following the defeat of the Nazis and that there was yeah. some intentional delay to, to weaken Russia. Um, Russia at, at this time um, across the Atlantic Wall, America and the Allied forces are facing maybe five to seven divisions, I believe. Yeah. And the Nazis or the Germans are currently facing the majority so, of the German army in the tune mm. of over 80. Mm. So just as a side note, the character being played by Robert Ryan, uh, Brigadier, Brigadier General James McGavin, 
uh, was a commanding general of the 82nd Airborne Division and mm. made four combat jumps during the Second World War. The only general officer during the Second World War to do that. Wow. I thought that was pretty friggin' interesting. And his men loved him. Yeah. And that's something you consistently see, too, amongst more of the Airborne Corps. You don't see, yeah. um, you know, with Patton, it was the old blood and guts, our blood, his guts. Um, yeah. Most of the Airborne commanders were beloved. And that's that's really excellently shown in Band of Brothers, um, how even the guys that are on the line have, like, an awe for their commanders because they're right up there with them. They're not hiding in a headquarters company. They're going Absolutely. out the door of a sky train just like everybody else. Wow. He made major general at the age of 37. Wow. Yeah, that is pretty impressive. Very fast uh, progression there. And there's the there's the classic double A of the 82nd. The All Americans on his uh, on his arm there, underneath the airborne. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And again, you know, the actor playing him is probably about 20 years too old as well. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, so yeah, both yeah. him and John Wayne are like far older than they would have been. I don't know why you would need a meteorological service in Britain. It's going to rain most days. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in uh, in contemporary America, this uh, this would not be a gentleman. It would be a leggy blonde. So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, the weather was the major enemy for um, for this invasion, uh, <clears throat> and waiting for exactly the right conditions to uh, begin the offensive um, literally from minute to minute trying to predict what was going on and I can only imagine how difficult it was for these people because this is long before we have modern satellites and things like that so how they were able to predict what the weather was going to be like absolutely limited technology use a slide rule and uh, <clears throat> results Get I don't know whether you noticed there that, that was that young secretary whose only line was, would you like some tea, sir, was Sean Phillips, the famous Welsh actress who later went on to uh, star in um, uh, A Lion in Winter and also in the original version of uh, Dune um, as a Bene Gennaret sister. So a very famous Welsh actress with, that must have been our first first role. So now we're seeing Heinz Reink, Colonel Josef Pips Priller. And uh, the Luftwaffe were spread pretty thin, weren't they, over this area of France? Is that yeah, right? I think they have, what, two planes available or two fighter craft available? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting to note, too, uh, in this instance, they're saying there's two. But, yes, they were um, – most all of the, uh, the Jastas were very limited in uh, not just aircraft but flight-worthy aircraft and because uh, a lot of their assets, again, are over on the, the eastern front yeah. fighting the Russians. Now, for the film itself, um, one of the things they were really concerned about was being able to get serviceable aircraft mm -hmm. to actually use for the film. And they found uh, the they're mocked up to look like ME 109s, but they're actually ME 108 tra or uh, 108 trainers uh. that they got um, <laughs> out of Spain. Franco Spain um, happened to have two that they were able to rent, and then Belgium <laughs> yeah. had two Supermarine Spitfires that they were able to rent. So the wow. four planes you see in the movie are legitimate World War II era fighters that they did rent from two separate countries for the film. Wow. You got to remember, this is 62. You've got a lot of nations that are still using World War II era fighters for both training because prop, prop yeah. aircraft in 62 were still uh, extraordinarily popular for uh, ground support roles yeah. because of, they were slow moving. Mm. Right. So, was there much um, American um, Air Force operating at this time? Then, I mean, I know the RAF were active. But um, you yeah, know, most, you had the most all the bombing and things like that, didn't you? Most all the bombing runs prior to the actual invasion were done by Allied uh, Allied bombers. You had the B-17s did a, a yeah. very high altitude, multiple sorties over the beach. Mm. They, because of cloud cover, missed their target mm. by miles. 
yeah. then you had uh, the lower lower tier middle me medium bombers, uh, your your B twenty four Liberators, your B twenty five Mitchells, yeah, um, and ground support aircraft like your Thunderbolts and P thirty nine Cobras, doing your uh, your air support, and they were much more. Uh, much more effective, um, obviously, much more effective on all the beaches other than Omaha. So, what about but what about fighters though? <clears throat> um, did the Americans have any fighters in the air on D Day? Yeah, you would have had a, a smattering of a cross section of everything, pretty much. Because by this stage, you know the, I mean the British had the Spitfire, but the Americans had the uh, Mustang. Um, which was a, a phenomenal aircraft, um, but I'm not sure how many were deployed during uh, Operation Overlord. It was mainly towards the end of the war, the P-54, I think, wasn't it? Uh, oh no, it was actually it was introduced in 1940. Yeah, they they had yeah. Yeah, I would. I don't know for sure. I, I would assume you'd have a. It'd be a smattering of everything because we threw everything we had at this. Mm. I mean, the most well-used one was the Dakota, the um, troop transport planes. Um, That's a C the C forty-seven. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, that's a Skytrain. Yeah. And of course, the other aircraft that was in use uh, for paratroopers uh, was the S-Speed Horsa, the gliders. Um, had about 25 men, I think. Uh, they were used to glide in the, the, the paratroop uh, regiments. Yeah, Morgan in the chat is saying uh, 5,409 fighters were available for the Allied forces on D-Day. Phew. Uh, superiority. So this is the meeting of the general staff, and we have um, <coughs> Henry Grace playing General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Yeah, I believe there must have been a time that must have been there must have been a, a real deadline to, to uh, mount this attack because <clears throat> they had to go when the weather conditions weren't ideal. Right. And I think the clock was kicking down. And to go back to what Aldous was saying earlier, perhaps the clock was kicking uh, ticking down because they were concerned about, you know, how far would the Russians get uh, if they had left it any longer, given how long it would take the Allied forces to get to Germany. And we, you know, we had that race to race to Berlin in the end, didn't we, in 1945? So, but we'll not know for sure ever. Right. I think some of the part of the problem was with was um, moon the 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 phase of the moon for the um, parachute the tides. The, the, the airborne. Yeah. yeah. So if they didn't go on on June 6th, they were going to be screwed for like three weeks or something. Yeah. I think he addresses it right here. Yeah. Not before July. So you're looking, yeah. <laughs> you're talking about delaying it for another 30 days. And the other <laughs> thing too, at this time, you've got back channels. Like I was alluding to, the Soviets were well aware that the West, the Western Front had not been opened yet, other than Southern Italy. And uh, Stalin, through back channels, was screaming at Churchill and Roosevelt to do something. Mm. So you have this tenuous alliance <laughs> against the Nazis that's, not doing too well in 44 because the Russians are feeling like they're doing all the heavy lifting and they're they're being decimated at this time too. It, yeah. The Russians are taking huge casualties. Um, yeah, it, it, they're making the they're pushing the Germans back, but at an extremely high cost. Mm. Mm. Well, it's, yeah. it's it's important <laughs> to keep in mind too that le in less than a year. The, the the Russians will be almost at Berlin, and uh, one of their generals calls back to Stalin and requests reinforcements, and Stalin's response is, there are no more men. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, and that's in a year that you have an entire generation of Russian youth, Russian men, young men, 
that are gone. It, 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 it just evaporated a generation, this war did. It's, it's amazing when you look at the numbers of how many people they lost. <laughs> and uh, John Wayne's just thrown his cup halfway across the room there in excitement. <laughs> <laughs> Every um, drew addicts. Yeah. I mean, the overall, just to give everybody an overarching view of the movie, um, the, the whole idea behind this is it's a docudrama. It has numerous scenes like we've already seen already, which are like small dioramas to give people an idea of, you know, the individual scale. And then we come back out into the macro view again. Um, and there's individual um, <laughs> set pieces like, for instance, the uh, French uh, commandos battling for... Um, is that Eddie uh, Albert? Is it? Was that Eddie Albert of Green Acres fame? Yeah, Colonel Thompson. Yep. There's uh, Lord Lavat, one of the one of the great Scottish peers of the realm. <laughs> do they, Pete? Do they actually cite Kiefer's boys in this? The Kiefer. Commander? Yeah, they do. Well, they, I, don't I don't think they mention that. the word, the name Kiefer, but they are Kiefer's commandos, um, and we see we see them attacking um, the uh, the Wisterham. Uh, the the port of uh, Wiesterham, and uh, also we have um, you know the the U.S. Ranger assault on Point de Hoc, and also we have uh, the paratroopers coming into Saint Marigliez. So there's a few different uh, touch uh, points, set pieces, um, mainly the advance troops who dropped in before the main invasion to secure the bridges, and uh, several um, key points. And uh, the you know the film rounds off with a another montage at the end to show how the allies moved on from establishing this as a beachhead. So right now they're uh, Ryan uh, the Gavin's doing his uh, his drop down on uh, talking to the pathfinders and these are the guys that drop before the main drop and all their job is is to light the landing zones. Yep. So. They're going in. They're the first people that are going to land, and these guys, these guys actually they they get blown off course, and it, it's just this is the start of it's already a logistical nightmare. You've got a quarter of a million men, you've got yeah. multiple countries, you've got multiple branches, multiple services, multiple commands. Everything is yeah. based on this delicate operation, and it all starts to go wrong very quickly. Yeah, and look, we're seeing here the the dummies that were used. Um, to cause the Germans to be, you know, misinformation, confusion. These, this is one of my favorite bits in the movie. These, these miniature paratroop dummies they used. <laughs> and Rupert the dolls were called. Yep. <clears throat> Little firecrackers in them. Yep. These are the clickers as well that they used. This was a. I think a bad idea, um, but well, it took it based off of uh, biographies. It took uh, Germans that were uh, responding to the drop um, a matter of hours before they would start picking up the clickers yeah. and uh, use them to draw. And uh, I was actually corrected by Morg um, before this stream because I remember a, a story yeah. that. Uh, the German response to D-Day, because yeah, the German troops are mostly young boys and older men. Yeah. Um, they were aux uh, mostly auxiliary forces. Uh, the synth sixth para, um, some Fallschirmjägers were in the area. And there were a couple of organic officers that uh, set aside comp troops and really went out and did a lot of... They were the only ones that really offered great resistance within the first uh, day or so. And uh, they were the ones that were picking up the clickers and using the clickers to draw paratroops out. And um, then they were isolating them. And it's it's fortunate that things went as well as they did on the beaches. Otherwise, uh, Ike's <laughs> projections of what the casualty count would have been might have been much more. And then, of course, uh, thank God. And this is something that um, I firmly believe in, is that yeah. the Allied cause was fighting for right and God was on our side. And uh, time and time yeah. again, throughout as you read about D-Day, it's it's the uh, just the miracles of heaven that things went as good as they did, and we were able to succeed. Because had uh, had Rommel or von Rundstedt been listened to, it would have been a totally different outcome. 
Panzer, Panzer reinforcements and Panzer Grenadiers would have been on the beaches a lot earlier, and heavy artillery would have been moved into place. Mm. And fortunately, exactly. the German arrogance uh, won out, as they say. Exactly, and you might have noticed as well in the background in that scene there was um, was an airspeed horse, uh, and you might have noticed there was no front onto it because it was built in three sections that could be taken apart easily. So the pilot section at the at the front was wasn't actually on there. The horse there actually had um, explosives on the rear end, so that when it landed, because most of these things crashed when they actually landed, um, the tail could be blown off. So that people could get out the back if they were trapped in there. Um, right, it's important to know these are gliders, so these yeah. were towed. Um, you have these C four. You have two two things going on with yeah. the uh, the Allied the early pre invasion for the Allies. You've got uh, paratroopers that are jumping out of the C forty sevens, and then you have gliders, and these gliders are carrying um, slightly heavier armed troops. Um, they might have. Pack 37s or Pack 75 millimeter howitzers, mm. so light anti tank guns, um, light howitzers. Mm. They've got heavier mortars. They've got more heavy machine guns. Um, they'd be probably classified. Carl might be able to correct me. I would assume as like medium infantry, um, not quite the same as like what you'd have in a motorized or a mechanized mm. uh, battalion. Mm -hmm. But they've still they're, they're a little bit heavier. And these gliders were towed behind the C 47s, and they just mm. cut them loose. And these gliders would then just slowly descend and then. The goal was yeah. to find a field and land softly in your field, mm. and uh, more often than not, the, gr the glider would crash into trees. It would. It was just. It, it was. It's just amazing what these guys did. Yeah, it is incredible the risk they took, and the the, the time that the allies had to, to cook up these different um, engineering solutions, like the you know the, the artillery, the tanks, the, the gliders, the the boats, the technology to get the, the landing craft, all of these things. The the advantage, of course, of the gliders was that the troops could sneak up unheard, unless obviously there was a huge crash. <laughs> right. and, uh, the apparently Pegasus mission, which is, uh, like I say, is a, is a, um, a set piece in this movie, uh, they were able to take two bridges in Pegasus mission, achieve, accomplish their main mission goals, and it was a surprise attack. These uh, bridges in uh, uh, Normandy were heavily defended, but the paratroopers took them within 10 minutes and captured both bridges. So it just shows you the, the power of being able to get the troops in surgically, you could say, for that pe for that period or nearest to it for that period and uh, get the troops in there quickly as a surprise attack. And this is, you know, the overcoming, overwhelming, confusing the Germans was the general gist of all of this. Um, with 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 varying levels of success. <laughs> <clears throat> so then we're getting the first reports into the uh, German high command. Is that what's going on? Yeah, it, it is. Oh, Mark Morgan. Yes, Pegasus Major Howard. I think it was Major Howard. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, of, uh, of who came to great. Uh, Great renown for later in yeah. the war. So we're seeing uh, this is uh, <clears throat> General Enrich Marx. Um, wounds my heart with monotonous anger. That's the that's the key phrase. So by now the Germans are starting to think. Yep, it's actually happening. Where were the um, Panzer divisions during this time? Were they not? Did the uh, British and Americans manage to confuse the Germans to move them? Didn't they? They uh, were yeah. they were positioned further inland. And the, they, they, did, they ran the interference in Calais, and that they started. To... Yeah, that was it. They were convincing the Germans that the invasion was going to happen much further up the coast. Right, and that was what Burton was alluding to earlier when he said they just finished a run over Calais. And there's the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine of the Spitfire, four Spitfires, and these would have been actual... Uh, yeah, this is actual footage. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're just about to see uh, Steiger, Rod Steiger, who was a destroyer commander. 
Of course, the destroyers were crucial, weren't they? Their uh, their artillery was uh, crucial in um, uh, bombing or, or shelling the uh, German gun positions. Yeah, yeah you have a lot of a lot of Maverick destroyer captains that did some amazing things once they realized mm. uh, how intact some of the beaches were. Mm. Mm -hmm. They put their boats at great risk. In fact, only uh, and shockingly, only one destroyer, a Norwegian destroyer, was the only one that was sunk by German counterfire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's untold um, stories of sacrifice and uh, incredible bravery um, because this was the big show, wasn't it? Yeah, this was like like we're telling you, saying in the in the in the pre-show. This is this is the most important day in the 20th century, with the possible yeah. exception of the day uh, we landed on the moon. So, yeah, this is the big show. Yeah, and I don't even think a Hollywood movie of a budget this size can capture yeah. the scale of what was what happened. Jeffrey Hunter, what what else was he in? He was in a bunch of B movies, and he's also in. He was he played a lot of those uh, teen heartthrob roles in the late fifties, early sixties. Wasn't uh, he in the? Wasn't he was in, in the, the Searchers? searchers. He's in the was, Searchers. Yeah, he was in the Searchers with John Wayne. Yeah. Thought so. I mean, you know, even if he didn't do anything else, he was in the searches. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So this is again in microcosm the individual stories of the individual troops. Uh, these two GIs talking about their memories of home. Yeah. You know, and the and the difference being that, you know, there was people in America before even Pearl Harbor who were saying, you know, let's get involved, let's get, let's join in this because, uh, let's go to a completely foreign continent. Uh, you know, I suppose inevitably, what, what would what would have happened if the Americans hadn't got involved? Well. Eventually, Britain would have crumbled. Um, Hitler would have occupied Europe. Hitler and Stalin would have inevitably started fighting each other. I think potentially Hitler would have lost to Stalin. Um, so we never know. But, um, you know, the, um, the thing people forget is that, you know, there was no immediate threat to America until Pearl Harbor. Right. Uh, I don't think the Japanese would have ever tried another attack against uh, against America at that point. I don't know why they did it. I really don't know. They had to. Militarily, you have they had to. And yeah. they did. At, just after Pearl Harbor, they, you have the assault at Midway. And if Midway would have fell, then the entire Pacific would have been open to the Japanese. Uh, right. So, and then they yeah. then they wouldn't have to, you know, they would never have to invade because you control the Pacific, and if you control the Pacific, then you control trade, mm. and then you could just starve the West Coast, not starve literally, but starve economically. Mm. And because then, then you also, if you've eliminated America from the Pacific, then it's no problem to sweep Britain in the South Pacific because yeah. they're holding on by a tenuous threat at that point. Yeah, I mean Singapore was lost very early. On. Singapore, Singapore has already fallen. Hong Kong has already fallen. Mm. Um, mm. You, the Philippines are gone to the Japanese. The, the the South. I mean, Australia is holding on on by a bitter edge mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with the uh, the blockades and the submarine attacks that they're dealing with for transport. Mm. Yeah, and here we see the sea. Uh, yeah, we're in. We're following the. Uh, I'm sorry if I get this wrong. C forty sevens. Yeah, Sky Trains, Dakotas. Yeah, and uh, they're towing. <laughs> towing a bunch of limeys <laughs> <laughs> in an airspeed <clears throat> uh, Normandy, and this is the first glider attacks. Um, so this must be Operation Pegasus. Orn River would be Pegasus, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry.
and this is the bridge of the Millennium Falcon we're watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's important to note as you uh, as you watch this, um, not so much this film, but Lucas was a uh, he he drew from everything, and so a lot of the uh, a lot of the imagery that you get from Star Wars is a direct representation of these great World War II movies. Yeah. Now it's a this is a cool little historical tidbit. Um, you always see this um, in all of your World War II movies with the British airborne guys. They've got these rags in their helmet. <clears throat> this was. Uh, Camouflage that was meant to uh, disrupt the silhouette. It's very, uh, very early, almost like a, what a ghillie suit is. Yeah, and it just disrupts the the silhouette of a head just enough. It's it's not meant to like cause anything other than a moment's hesitation of is yeah. that a man or not to buy the guy one extra second of response. Yeah, so you can get the knife in or a shot in. Um, the 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 only one of the few things the British were able to do for most of the war in Europe were um, commando operations. So that that that's that's what they've been doing mainly, and that was, I think, Churchill's favourite mode of um, attack because it was really good for propaganda as well. There's well, the a lot of what's uh, Major Howard. Mm, Sorry, and a lot of what's going on too with um, the planning and the implementation of the amphibious assault was learned with the uh, the tragic uh, results of the raid at Dieppe. Mm, um, yeah, absolutely. Two years earlier. By the Canadians yeah. and the commando force, and it was a known. Um, it was known they were going to face heavy resistance, but they wanted to try something um, just for some lessons learned. And then you also have the U.S. Army bringing over, as well as the British, um, a lot of their knowledge from what they've been doing in the Pacific for how they've been handling um, ally or amphibious assaults. Because mm. this is they had never done this before. All this is new, mm. so it's new tactics being deployed, um, mm -hmm. glider assaults, and here you see the Horsha landing, yeah. sliding through. And uh, you can see how they just all crumple these gliders when they... That was a relatively good landing. <laughs> Everybody survived. So this is this is not Pegasus, and this is... Uh, is it not? It is. It's no, this is Pegasus. Yeah, yeah. Horn <laughs> River, just outside of... Uh, is it Khan? Yeah. Of course, Khan wasn't captured for a while after this. The the Germans were dug in very well, and uh, the main objective of DD was to capture Khan really quickly, but we weren't able to. Um, this is the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. Infantry. Yeah, and this is actually, if you if you notice, um, not to, I mean it's a movie, so you can't criticize it too much, but the. Uh, the squad level tactics here are terrible. This is Hollywood. This is not how it would have been. Um, the commandos, as soon as they stepped out of the glider, would have interspersed and covered a lot of ground. Correct. Um, there would be a lot further spread out than this. <laughs> if you see them, they're moving together in larger groups. They, these, this, you, would, you would see guys moving in like rounds of three to four men fire teams. And yeah. uh, fire teams would work in coordination with other fire teams, and you'd yeah. have staggered motion. Um, it. The, they were the, the commandos, the airborne units. Again, they're highly trained. Um, as you get into the America uh, American units, the the 82nd and the 101st, you're going to see ad hoc formations start to form because the guys get dropped everywhere. Mm -hmm. And one of the benefits of their training was that you could take guys from <coughs> Alpha Company and Delta Company, and they just knew how to work together, even though they never had mm -hmm. before because they were trained and just everybody was trained the same way. Mm -hmm. These are this is how we're going to do it, and they all listen. They listen to their commanders. Yeah, the discipline level was excellent in the airborne divisions. So here they're um, removing the charges that were set by the German sappers to blow yep. the bridge. Cut communication lines. French resistance. So timestamp wise, I think I'm about fifty five minutes coming up on uh, just about thirty seconds now. All right. I'm yeah, at fifty five twenty six, twenty six. Yeah. So I'm only like four seconds ahead of you there, yeah. Fifty five thirty is my mark right yeah. there. I'm two seconds behind you, Hux, no big deal. So they just brought the, uh, Yep, the, so the they just blow up. sorry there, Carl. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So just blowing down the um, 
uh, telegraph or te um, phone wires there. Right, and then, well, this is what the resistance was doing. Uh, Wild Bill Donovan's boys from the OSS, MI5, MI6, they're, they're cutting communication lines, they're laying trees across roads, they're doing anything they can to disrupt responses to buy these guys just a little bit more time. Yeah, I remember watching this movie with my dad many years ago, and his summation of the film was, he said to me, you know, the, the main activity at this time was the intention was to confuse the enemy and disorganize the enemy and dishearten the enemy as much as possible. Uh, so, so you're basically making as much of a mess of the enemy as possible so that when your forces arrive, they're disorganized, the enemy's disorganized, you know? And then a disorganized enemy is a lot easier to defeat. <laughs> that's uh the the doctor the uh the medic for that unit <clears throat> so now this is the this is the problem that a lot of airborne units uh developed was mm. oh you take you take your target you take your target quickly you're mm. You're airborne, so you're qualified as light infantry. You have very little anti-tank. You have very little yep. in the way of heavy machine guns. Yeah. Now they're stuck. Now they got to maintain it. And yeah. It, it, you know, all you have are set machine guns and the few hand grenades yep. you have with you. So you need to be backed up very quickly. So yeah, here they're talking about the the seventh para. That's their support, and then uh, Lovat and his commandos. But you've got mm. other issues. Your immediate problems are you're you're close to Khan. You've got multiple German mm -hmm. responses. How how mm -hmm. what what's the plan? Mm -hmm. So hold until relieved. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, part of that. It, it's kind of if you want to, you could take like this movie and then watch Operation Market Garden. And if you watch that, if you watch Operation Market Garden or read the book, you you kind of don't understand the level of arrogance on some of the Allied commanders. And it's because things on D-Day went as bad as they went, as chaotic as it was. Mm. They accomplished so many objectives that they thought they could do it again. And yeah, things so on didn't refine the garden didn't go today, quite yeah. as well. <clears throat> yeah. That's a, that was typically English of you to say it that way, Aldous. this very understatement when you said that. Not quite as well. <laughs> you can... <laughs> well, I, I guess we picked a, a bridge too far, my good man. <laughs> yes. Oh well, no mind. <laughs> but fortunately, on D-Day, they did not pick a bridge too far, and fortunately yeah. for the these great men, they were able to accomplish so many of their uh, objectives despite the chaos that they were thrown into. Yeah, um, I'm also seeing here as well that the filming of the movie, um, w um, the later set piece scene with the French um, keepers commandos uh, unit uh, was actually filmed in. And New Easterham. Um, so that is the actual town of Easterham that you see. Mm. Um, but uh, the actual locations of Pegasus Bridge near Benouville, Calvados, Saint Marie-Glisse, and Pont du Hoc, they are what we've just seen there was the actual Pegasus Bridge. So here we are back with the 82nd Airborne. Done for St. Mary Gleese. So one of the other things that was real important is whether they were Americans, whether they were British, whether they were any of the other allied countries uh, airborne, everybody knew everybody else's goals. Mm -hmm. um, all of the target points were known. All of the hold points were known. All of the secure points were known. Yeah. So when it came to what's going to happen with the total chaos, that, that's why everybody could just blend and accomplish their goal. You'd figure out uh, figure out where you're at, how far are you off, and what's your nearest target. And people would focus on that. It was a, and that's one of the things that the Germans. If you get into yeah. um, some of the the biographies, a lot of, of a lot of the German, uh, not high command, but company commanders following yeah. the war, they were astonished by how quickly, um, especially American units, could organically organize and respond tactically. And it was simply that it, it wasn't so much training. It was just the, the American mind. It's American ingenuity. It's, well, we got to accomplish this goal, so we're going to get it done. As well, the Germans, see, went, the Germans weren't used to fighting Americans, were they? So it was a bit of an unknown quantity for them. 
They so, weren't used to the they weren't used to the chaos. Um, mm -hmm. British troops were very structured in how they fight, so they were used to that. They were used to the French structure of fighting. The the Americans, which uh, American military had changed drastically from World War One, and so you have much more of an organic response. American German commanders were taught um, <clears throat> at the the NCO level, the sergeant and below, mm -hmm. to make uh, immediate combat decisions and to split their squad or their platoon up. Um, they weren't relying upon a lieutenant to make tactical decisions. The American military wasn't built that way, but organically resulted in that way by its very nature of how we go into, how we went into this situation. So it's, it was almost the Germans were fighting themselves in a way indirectly. And you, and you have so this- So here we are in Cannes. Mm, yeah, you have this wonderful situation occurring over and over again where high ranking German officers are uh, giving their surrender to like lieutenants and things like that <laughs> and complaining because who is this unwashed American who I have to hand my sword to? Because <laughs> the, the, you know, the, the, uh, all of this, as you were saying earlier, this Prussian pride in the Germans expecting to be able to surrender to somebody of equal rank. So these huge guns here, uh, anti-aircraft anti guns as well, laying out flak, etc., for um, the the dummies, the GI Joes or action men. <laughs> yeah, part of the um, the deception campaign. Yeah, and this is again, it's confuse confuse the Germans. It's a pretty good trick. And the good thing about this is no people nobody has to die to execute this maneuver. <laughs> Unless some of the Germans shot each other, friendly fire. Which is a, a contradiction in terms, isn't it really? Friendly fire. <laughs> Call for reinforcements. <laughs> I don't imagine this movie's very popular in Germany. What What do you think, <laughs> gentlemen? Well, um, it's not taking a uh, an editorial stance on anything. It's just telling how it happened. Yeah, I suppose that's right. There's no bias here, unlike modern movies. Uh, this is a, a very factual, as near as possible anyway, uh, representation of what happened. <clears throat> Another commando paratroop regiment being dropped in here. Well, actually, just two or three guys, isn't it? Yeah, these might be uh, some of the OSS or the MI6, MI5 guys. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I thought that was Sophia Loren to start with. It sure looked like uh, it, didn't it? Yeah, didn't it? Yeah. But no, it's uh, Arena Demick. Never heard of her. Yeah. And he's uh, Le Commando de Francais. Ah, c'est très bon. There you go. Allez, allez, vite, vite. <laughs> <clears throat> and here's. An average German soldier. Poor guy. He's just this poor bastard just got up to go work <laughs> watching a railroad. <laughs> yeah. Little did he know. <laughs> He's like, <clears throat> well, you know, I've got myself a cushy little number here. <laughs> yes. How's little bad? little How did he know? Could it be? <laughs> <laughs> he has his friend, Bossy Stoss. Uh, nine. <laughs> yeah, it's explosive charges are laying under the railway there. He's got a Luger, the French guy. Yeah, yeah I'm a couple seconds behind it. Yeah, that's a Luger. Yep. <clears throat> Yeah, 
Qu'est-ce que c'est? What is it? Okay. I'll go. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They could probably plug these guys with no problem. Yeah. She's going to try the uh, distraction The old uh, the honey pot trick? Yep. <clears throat> And uh, trying to distract them so they're looking in that direction. Right. These two Germans speak very good French. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, the Germans and French were, had been fighting each other for quite a long time, you know. Uh, every, every 20 or 30 years, they had a pop at each other. How do we know she's not speaking <laughs> German? Yeah. Oh, I guess it does say it does. You can't hear the voices. So never mind. And these uh, pot helmets that the Germans wear, Carl. This, did their shape or design come from anywhere specific? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's all based off of the uh, the Model 1916 helmet, which was designed to uh, help the. German soldiers in the trenches with shrapnel and things like that with the little neck covering part. And it, it all basically developed off of the needs of, of trench warfare. Mm -hmm. But historically the design does, does go back uh, mm -hmm. to like the 15th century or so. Uh, it kind of looks like a, a Salet helmet, which was a style of helmet that was popular in Germany during that time. Mm -hmm. But uh no, the, the, the main design was, was from the needs of trench warfare. Mm. And anybody who's a Doctor Who fan might notice that the top of a Dalek looks like that as well. Because <laughs> the, <laughs> Daleks, the Daleks are based on uh, the Nazis. <clears throat> a bit like the Stormtroopers are based on Nazis as well. So now she's uh, paying the price, but uh, the French commando gets gets him there. That bullet would have gone straight through the, the German soldier and into her as well. Oh yeah, that's not a good Where, idea. Uh, yeah, Hollywood, well, that... Hollywood again. <laughs> not necessarily. I mean, the, the Sten only fired a nine millimeter round. Mm, that's true. And, and the Sten was actually the Sten was actually manufactured to be uh, to be easily uh, collapsible and disassembled and reassembled. Yeah, a very a very efficient gun, the Sten. Um, <clears throat> that difficult for most other people, but very easy for the British, <laughs> right, Pete? <laughs> um, I mean, the, the one of the things I remember about the Sten gun is it it. It didn't use any wood, did it? It just it was just metal. No, it, the, the shoulder uh, rest. Yeah, it was a stamped metal weapon that had notorious issues. And now, <laughs> this is one of the best lines of the movie: "Ruby pooping, <laughs> Ruby pooping." Here's another typical Rush, uh, Prussian uh, Prussian commander here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, uh, General Eric Marx. This is, uh, oh, this is Marx. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we're discovering that the German word for here is here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> Ruberpuppen is uh, a repair trooper. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> There's the Rube Puppen right there. Das ist, das ist ein Rube Puppen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if this is, uh, if this is Marx, it's uh, Marx uh, six days from now is wounded in an allied uh, air attack and passes away. Yep, that's right. Yeah, 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 that's correct. Yeah, and um, I think they might mention that later on the well, movie. I'm not sure. I mean, look at him. He probably can't run away when he sees the, uh, <laughs> when he sees the plane. Coming in for the straight <laughs> run. 
<laughs> That'll have been a fencing duel wound or something, or maybe it maybe a bit like... of shrapnel. Yeah. Yeah. Now these two are Max Pencil. Wolfgang Price plays Major General Max Pencil. Yep. And we have Wolfgang Price. What a name, huh? Wolfgang. Yeah. And the General. And he has a typical short Prussian haircut, doesn't he? He's like the uh, <clears throat> it's the ultimate warrior. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Morg, Morg just shot me some more information, too, that um, over 30,000 French civilians were killed um, as via collateral damage in the first 30 days, approximately, of the Normandy campaign. Wow. And uh, high command was paranoid because the <clears throat> most all of the resistance against the Nazis was pretty well split yeah. between <laughs> communists and non-communists. Um, who were pretty much only allied in their fight against the fascists. Yeah. So there was great concern that uh, yeah. this tenuous alliance between these uh, conflicting views was, would be broken by uh, just the devastation that was being wrecked mm. you know, throughout the Normandy region of France. <laughs> and here we're seeing the disastrous um, or random chance of uh, where the American Rangers are being dropped in here. And some of them are, you know, crashing into buildings and and yeah, yeah, this is a this is a British paratrooper him. So it's a mixture of American and British troops, these airborne divisions. Um and of course he's this is a famous scene where the guy drops down the well. Um Morg's also pointed out that the Sten gun uh with bits is storm troop, a stormtrooper blaster. As I usually point out every few days, he says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 21st Panzers when you can. Yeah. So, Panzer Division. So, were there any Tiger tanks as well? Um, I actually have the complete... I have all of the... I have a three-volume set that does the history of every Tiger tank because I'm a World War II nut. Mm. And, um, yeah, there were a few Tigers deployed. Um Mm. Not very many, but you have to remember too. Um, it uh, it's like D plus three or four, and after a while, the, it doesn't mm. take long for the allies to figure out that the Tiger is a a, a terrible tank mm. that they have uh, very little other than air support that can do anything against. And so, reports of Tigers are greater than actual Tigers because yeah. every tank <clears throat> becomes a Tiger. Mm. This is Captain uh, Kurt, the actor Kurt Meisel, Captain Ernst During. Famously in the movie, puts his boots on back to front because he's off to sleep, which is a reference which is later alluded to because you see the boots later on and you realize, oh, yeah, it's that guy with his boots on back to front. So we're about one hour, 14 minutes and just coming up to 30 seconds now. which is we're nearing the halfway point for the movie and it's a really well paced movie because you know this the the attacks already begun the advance guard being dropped in oh, damn it. and uh, also the air raids would have woken up the various dogs there <laughs> <laughs> So the Germans are now, I mean, that's a pretty bad place to land, isn't it? <laughs> right in the courtyard. <clears throat> yeah, right in front of them. Yep. Getting a, good. A, you know, rifle butt to the face and being that in shot. Yep. Not good. Where have you come from? Awfully sorry, old man. Landed here by accident. <laughs> <laughs> Awfully sorry, old man. <laughs> Famous uh, British actor there, John Gregson. Plays the Padre. Uh, oh 
God. Come <laughs> for the communion set. <laughs> And sure enough, he enlists the other guy to help him out. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Stone the Crows, if you want to know what that means, is a reference. Oh, he's got it now. Stone the Crows means, would you believe it? Goodness me, etc. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> and now we have Major Werner Pluskat, played by Hans Krinsian Blech. Pluskat. <laughs> if you look at the, the picture of his profile thing on, on the side where it gives you the info on these guys, <laughs> yeah, it's like he's shocked. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that picture right there fits his name, Hans Christian Blech, so well. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Van Eyck plays Lieutenant Colonel Ocker uh, on the other end of the line there I want to know who plays Pluscott's dog um, a German Shepherd <laughs> <laughs> I knew German Shepherd So, at this stage, the Germans are still confused about what's going on. <clears throat> I don't think they believe it's a, a you know, a full-on <laughs> invasion at this point. I think they just think it's a commando operation. And now we get the scene. I'm at uh, saint mer Zero, two, or three hours. You got a bucket brigade going to put out some fires. Yep. Yeah. It's a very inefficient method. And <clears throat> this, of course, is one of the um, the targets, one of the mission objectives, this town, because of its strategic importance. And And so, yeah, there's, there's been several paratroop airborne divisions drop nearby, and I think the scene's coming up where we see some more, some more of that happening. Now they're getting word from the lady that saw the paratrooper earlier. That this the uh, aren't happening. Yeah, this actress, Madame Barreau, was played by a French actress called Arletti, who apparently was a femme fatale when she was young. Um, there we go. It's <clears throat> <laughs> the uh, Je Sweet American. <laughs> Bonjour. Is, they're the great comedian Red Buttons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he had a big TV show or something at the time. On, in, yeah. On his yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was before my time. Maybe Steve Dye would know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I so. saw... No, can't be. I mean, I know I know Henry Fonda's in the movie. It's just so somebody who looked like him, but it can't have been because he's much yeah, later on in the movie. Plays, movie. Uh, movie yeah. Teddy Roosevelt Jr., yeah. right? Yeah. This, we said yeah. he uh, passed away after D-Day following a, a severe heart attack. Right. He was a Medal of Honor winner, wasn't he? I believe so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So this this famous scene in the movie here, uh, again, where the you know the Rangers are dropped in haphazardly into into the town, and you know they end up everywhere. And again, they're just sitting ducks, literally, for the Germans. Yeah, this is a really shocking scene. This coming. Yeah, it's, uh, this is one of the tragedies of D Day. Right yeah, here. yeah. This is one of the real. Sort of like heavy losses for the American troops here coming up. Um, <clears throat> because, that, you know, this is all planned in advance. I don't think they knew they were going to be dropping in 
to this situation, be, you know, everything's lit up with that fire and Germans are just ready for them. No, oh, actually, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. won his uh, Medal of Honor for his actions at Utah Beach on D-Day. Hmm. I'm sure part of that was political. So Red Buttons is playing Private John Steele. And of course, the comedy, there's a it's a tragedy, but there's a bit of a comedic moment here where he tries to sort of get out of danger, but the cords on his shoot start to rip and you know tear, and he's a bit. Oh, I can't actually. He can't actually move because he'll fall if he moves. So what? What does he do? What do you do in a situation like that? <clears throat> right. Exactly. Or you'll be discovered and shot. Yeah. So he's either going to fall to his. He's just lost his knife. <laughs> That's fallen right by the German. <laughs> uh oh. Shot him in the boot, in the foot. Yeah, that's going to rip you apart, that kind of gun, isn't it? I can't remember what that one was. That was an MG42. Yeah, that's just going to tear to shreds. Yeah. The MG42 had a rate of fire of over a thousand rounds a minute but uh they would never fire it that fast the in fact the 42 had two triggers uh, there were two variants of the 42. um the the more difficult variant to produce that probably was not as prevalent um had two triggers one of them was only a burst trigger um because otherwise you you couldn't fire it full auto for long because it would actually the, the heat dissipation would melt the barrel yeah they actually had to carry multiple barrels with those units it was basically replaceable. Yeah, it, it takes time, but um, a trained machine gun crew could do it in under a minute to swap out barrels. Same thing with the Browning 30 cal. Right. Or the M2. Because all of the uh, all of your medium and heavy machine guns in World War II at this point are, uh, air, are air-cooled. Right, yeah. Because I was just wondering, I mean, I, I was looking into the uh, artillery for this movie as well, and learning about things like um muzzle guards at the end the to allow the gases to escape at the end of the barrel muzzle break that's yeah. it muzzle breaks yeah because you get getting the so your, goal, your, your goal on a muzzle break is to de to el eliminate the gases to the sides yeah so that you you don't have a muzzle flash you don't have as much of a muzzle flash yeah and then it also by doing that you're eliminating any drag effect that you're causing to the round itself. Because mm. at this stage you've got really high powered rounds. Uh... So yeah, I mean, the chances of survival in this war were fairly slim if you got hit with anything. Uh... Yeah, it depends where and how quickly someone got a hold of you medically. I mean, you got to remember now. At least we have real doctors, as opposed to like the American Civil War, where they're still, yeah. you know, basically doing medieval style surgery. Yeah, and you've got a medic in each unit. Is that right? Or probably at the company level, you'd have one. You'd have, yeah, a... you'd have corps corpsmen um, at the company level for sure. Mm -hmm. But everybody would have um, would have been issued with morphine, I imagine. Probably not the uh, the average Joe, because you know. Imagine if what what would happen on the black market with that. Yeah, you'd sell it on. So this is an example of what's going to happen with the clickers here. This lucky bloke has a has a Thompson submachine gun. Yeah, Five caliber. It's pistol round, but at close <laughs> range is just going to knock anything down. I mean, yeah, this that... guy. Sorry, go, go ahead. Oh, the Thompson was uh, one of the few. The Thompson and the BAR. Um, BAR gunners were especially noted for to be targets for German snipers. Um, Thompson gunners were feared um, in close range because the 45 ACP round is just it's devastating. I've just noticed the clicker is a frog. 
(laughs) 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 And he's clicked his frog, so he thinks everything's falling apart. Oh, no. No. It's a cyber frog. Oh. Yep. That's Salmonea right there. Yep. So here's the the Germans have already adapted to the uh, the secret communication of the uh, the allies, yeah. the paratroopers, and uh, they're on to it. Yeah. The I mean, I thought it was Tally Savalas for a minute. I know it's not, but he looked a lot like him. <clears throat> it was a different actor. This is an actor called Richard Beimer, or Beimer, playing Private Dutch Schultz. Hey, that's a nice GI name, isn't it? Hey, <laughs> Private Private Dutch Schultz, reporting, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that's a proper GI name, that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I believe, isn't that the guy that played Murdoch? Isn't that his name? No, it's Dwight Schultz. Dwight Schultz, yeah. okay. Dutch Schultz was uh, the mobster. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? With Luciano and, uh, yeah. oh, what's his name? Can never remember the guy yeah, that Meyer ran uh, Harlem. It wasn't Meyer Lansky, was it? No, Lansky was uh, Lansky was the money man with uh, Siegel. Yeah, who was also Murder, Murder Inc., wasn't he? I believe so. Yeah. Now, we don't know at this point if the people on the other side of the wall are Germans Oh, are they Americans? We don't know what's going to happen when he gets over the other side of the wall. And thank God they were ge- Americans. <laughs> so there you go. You see the the bald eagle head on their on their arm. These guys are 101st screaming eagles. Screaming eagles, baby. <clears throat> and this shows you too. They're like well, 101st. Like where the hell's the 82nd? Like that's how mixed up they are. You've got guys in different divisions. That are yeah. all over the place. Yeah. But they all just blend together. They're forming ad hoc units and they're going to go accomplish their goals. So, as you look at their weaponry, too, yeah. um, you've got your <clears throat> quite a few Thompsons. You've got yeah. uh, some M1 Garands. You've got yeah. some guys that are carrying M1 carbines. Yeah. And uh, I believe in a couple of background scenes, there's even a yeah. few guys carrying M3 grease guns. Mm. Mm-hmm. Given the choice of those armaments, which would you have wanted in this situation, Aldous? Uh, I I love the M1 carbine. I think it's a it's an excellent weapon for both its weight and the fact that you can throw a a thirty round mag in it. And um, it is a lightweight, but, but I find that the thirty thirty round doesn't necessarily have the stopping power I'd like. So if you no, it doesn't. But I, I, as a paratrooper, I'd much rather have something that's a little more compact than. Uh, I mean, I I love uh, I love shooting grands, <laughs> and uh, there's nothing oh, yeah, wrong yeah. with a thirty six round. <laughs> But uh, I love this scene. <laughs> they just walk straight past each other in the darkness without noticing each other. <laughs> a whole well, unit this is, this of Germans. Is, this is an example of one of those little stories that um, the author picked up on yeah. from some guy he interviewed after the war. Yeah. And this shit, this this is an incident that, that happened. It's anecdotal, but. But this goes back to what Aldous was saying as well, Carl, about divine intervention. Perhaps if they had have engaged each other, they would have all died. You know, yeah. uh, these weird chance events that occur that are beyond belief. You know. Well, yeah. the, you know, the one I always like to point out when I talk about that, and people poo poo me, is uh, Midway with Strawberry Five. I mean, it, it's a desperate gamble at Midway on yeah. who spots who first and who can get their people in the air first and. You've got we, our an American airman spots what he thinks are ships. They they circle back around and they find the entire Japanese fleet. And then not only do we launch on time and get plane, you know, mm-hmm. torpedo bombers and the dive bombers on the fleet, they've got all of their planes on the deck when we hit them. Mm-hmm. It's just it's you. There's no luck does not happen in that regard. That is the divine hand of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see that sort of thing play out throughout all history, you know. You find different examples of it. Uh, That's a really good example of it. And here we see um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel has broken his leg. And that's a great line, too, by uh, by John Wayne with his, uh, I'm sorry, Colonel, I didn't didn't break it. Like, yeah, well, you don't have to walk on it either. 
<laughs> hey, hey, also, side note: look at the uh, the direction of his uh, his patch on his shoulder right there, and then think about you know a certain drawing we saw a few weeks ago, <laughs> which wasn't drawn by an American. So, <laughs> but that's no excuse. <laughs> I'm just saying, in World War II, that's the direction of the shoulder patches yeah, went. Absolutely. Um, The, I'm going to just hit a quick break at this point, guys, if you're all right to keep it going while yeah, I'm yeah. just be a bit, uh, about a minute. No problem, Pete. So he's five, they're, they're five miles from their drop zone. That was a function yeah, he, of what, just uh, bad intel and uh, what? I mean, how the how they fucked that up? Did the weather screw up the... Uh, yeah, it was, it was a combination of cloud cover, um, just general general disorganization too nothing like this had ever been done before right. um, i mean the largest airborne operation prior to d-day that had ever been done in history was the the german attack on crete and if you think d-day was an absolute disaster go read a book on what happened to the german Fallschirmjägers at crete right, that right. was even worse and uh, you know, following this, then you have Operation Market Garden, which is another massive airborne event, and it, that's a clusterfuck. And it only continues. Uh, airborne operations are just—you're dropping from a plane at altitude with a parachute. You're not going to be accurate. Yeah, exactly. And this we got to remember isn't a day before you know we had satellites that could map out the ground and and the terrain for you for that kind of pinpoint accuracy. Well, you've got you've got aircraft that are, you know, they're they're only using a compass. Um, mm -hmm. They're using ground reference for right. what they want. It's so here the Germans are starting to figure out what the plan is. In the meantime, Lou did they know they've already lost the Pegasus Bridge, and there are uh, airborne troops descending upon St. Mary Police. and the main. Uh, Oh, they're debating over whether Normandy is the uh, the diversion or Calais is the diversion. So, again, without having um, input from the high command, they're kind of like all these generals are bickering back and forth about what to do, and no one's taking action. Right. No, it is. Uh, I I don't want to like come across in the wrong way here, but uh, Hemsel was actually one of the first. German commanders to recognize what was going on and to start organizing um, organic responses to it. Um, he was shut down by high command at almost every point as he tried to organize anything larger than small conf groups as responses. But he did an ex he did a good job in in regards to the limited control that he had. And his reward was to be shipped off after Operation Overlord and the successful invasion of D-Day by the German high command to Finland for the rest of the war mm. where he saw no combat. So, mm. and it, you kind of see this, um, at this point, Germany has almost become more political than military military. And you get a lot of guys that kind of usurp the high command and do things, even though they accomplish goals, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's, I mean, it's one of the reasons why Germany loses is it, they're, they're making political decisions and not tactical decisions. Right. And it, it's, and it's, it's important. It's, it's important to reference that because of where we are in America right now politically, that how are we fighting in the wars or not the wars because we haven't declared war since World War II, but the, the conflicts that we're in, how are, we, uh, how are we handling ourselves? Are we handling ourselves based off a response to political or are we responding tactically? How are we fighting? Indeed. And we've just seen Lord Lovett there talking to uh, the senior staff <clears throat> and also addressing the French commander unit, uh, which isn't directly mentioned as Kiefer commandos, but uh, it is. And now we've moved on to the scene between um, Henry Fonda here, playing Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Teddy Jr., is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, really. Actually, <laughs> arguably Teddy the third, but Teddy yeah. And... Uh, He's talking to uh, the actor Edmund O'Brien, but playing General Raymond D. Barton.
Henry Fonda is another one of my favourite American actors. He's like I was saying uh, to Carl last week when did Magnificent Seven, uh, and it was James Coburn. In a similar way, uh, Henry Fonda has this sort of really graceful way that he moves. Um, yeah, Fonda. Fonda is. Uh, I mean, he's a, he's a cinematic deity, right? I mean, he's just yeah. he holds he holds presence. Absolutely. And so few actors hold that kind of presence. He knows how to command the scene. And he's a supreme actor. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, he really is a fine actor, or was a fine actor. And his daughter's not too bad either. <laughs> uh, Especially in Barbarella. There uh, we go. Hey, yo. <laughs> Yeah, that's the only thing. She's got a uh, she's got a, a lot of baggage. Well, it, yeah, she was one of the major Anoy people. Jane. <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah, it yeah. Does yeah. look. Granted, it's behind an anti-artillery piece that shot at American fighters and bombers and could have shot one down. But in that picture, yeah. she still looks good with the helmet on. I think since then, she, she has yeah. said since then, you know, that she's realized she was probably wrong to do that. <laughs> probably. Right, the, the key word in that Probably, is, yeah. Probably. All right, so let me tell you a story then. This involves Hanoi Jane and D-Day. So my great uncle, my dad's uncle, his godfather, uh, he had five daughters, and he was at D-Day. And uh, after the whole Hanoi Jane thing, he was a patriot all his life, big time, you know, you know, Mil pro military guy. Anyway, uh, in the eighties, one of his daughters, his youngest daughter, was still living with him, and she got one of those uh, Jane Fonda workout tapes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he comes in, and she's working out to this Jane Fonda shit. He 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 goes over the VCR, and pulls in, he goes, "What is this?" And she goes, it's "My workout tape." He take, walks over the door and throws as hard he can as he can down the street, and says, "Now it's trash." <laughs> <laughs> so here we have uh, Kiefer. And uh, Kiefer's a great, uh, a really, and the French are derided in Western media. But I just want to clarify something: the free French that were fighting for the Allies these are some these oh, are hardcore hard. nationalist French. Absolutely, these, these guys wanted their country back. Oh yeah, and they I fought their way out of France. They they were the rear guard as yep. the BAF, BEF <laughs> got off at Dunkirk barely. Yeah. Um, they gave their lives so that the British troops could come, could go home and come back another day. Exactly. These are the survivors of that. These guys are heroes. Yeah. Um, you can make as many jokes about Frenchmen as you want, but these guys, yeah. anybody that's part of this operation that's French. <clears throat> Interestingly, as well, the, these were all Britains. They were, uh, re you know, they were, came from Brittany. Uh, so it was their land that they were taking back. Um, and I saw a documentary just today. Uh, filmed a few years ago with the actual surviving veterans of that commando unit. And they were talking about their experiences. And they said, you know, one of them was only 14 when he joined up and he had to fight his way out of a prisoner of war camp to join the resistance and then fled to, uh, he got on a, a, a boat which apparently sank uh, off the coast of England and managed to get into England and join up with the rest of the free French and became right, a so, commando. So here you just saw him. Uh, you just saw him get off the phone, and he's saying Yodel. Yodel's not going to make a call. So they've now German command on um, along the French coast has made a call to high command Yodel, mm. and gone like, "What do you want us to do?" And Yodel again. This is mm. it's all political. He won't make a decision unless he mm -hmm. talks to the fear. Nobody's going to wake up Hitler. Hitler's mm -hmm. still asleep, so we're going to wait. Yeah. <laughs> he literally, he literally just going. signed his death warrant because uh, if he does, he, if he takes action here, he could have turned the attack. Well, and no, and he is, he is executed in Nuremberg in 1946. Yep, and beyond this, also you've got uh, you've got sub commanders um, throughout the battalion level that are screaming across communication lines on the German side right now that they want armored support, they want artillery support. Well, why are they not getting any of the, the support that yeah. traditionally in the German military they would have immediately at a phone call? Yep. And uh, there, there's uh, Soldat is an excellent book, and I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but there's multiple accounts 
of uh, like colonels, the equivalent of a colonel in the German military talking about their frustration at this point that they were let down at every level by high command because they're trying to wage a war and they're trying to do everything by the book and follow the rules and they can't. And you get a couple of rogues like yeah. Hemsel that are just, they just react and they do exactly what you should do. And they're all punished mm. across the board. And so it's kind of the it's kind of the same thing you see in the Soviet Union in the yeah, in the 30s, exactly, yeah. where they took all their good commanders and they moved them to Siberia, and then it's it's a miracle because it saved Russia in a way because after the initial push of Barbarossa, they were able to pull guys like Zhukov out yeah. of Siberia and go, okay, wh yeah. what can we do? Yeah. And then they get the the push back because the great minds were saved. Unfortunately, here. Uh, or fortunately, I guess, fortunately for the world, unfortunately for the Germans, um, the response is all political. Everything is everything is command structure. Everything is control, which goes against everything that they've followed up to this point of their accomplishments in the war. Yeah, um, absolutely. The, 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 the already at this stage, the German political system was becoming as top heavy as the as the Soviet model dictatorship nobody could do anything without consulting the head man here's the allied uh, uh, armada has just appeared on the horizon and uh major verna plus cat now needs to change his um plus fours yeah he's got to uh <laughs> he's got to swap out that penny my liner. god my bridge is on the schweizer scheisse <laughs> 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 And yeah, th this is th th this was the one of the contributing factors to Operation um, Valkyrie, wasn't it? The fact that the German uh, military class was could see that the whole thing was falling apart because it was completely bureaucratic. And right, well, it was one of the, it was, it's one of the massive failures of mm. how they structured their military, mm. and it, it was mirrored, Pete, in the British, and the British had the same problem. And it, it's, you've got, if you were born of upper crust, upper society, you had a much easier path. And here we have General Omar Bradley, uh, the namesake of the Bradley fighting vehicle, who was uh, over Pat. He was the subsordinate of Pat and, and uh, passed. He was, Patton was passed over mm -hmm. so that Bradley. Yeah, General Bradley eventually becomes uh, General of the United States Army post war. Uh, he's actually really one of the really heavy hitters of the Second World War European theater. So, yeah. This is one of the few French ships that actually defected rather than waiting till the very last minute, the Vichy uh, disaster, uh, where the French Navy refused to uh, declare allegiance to the Allied forces that were still... Um, free um so a lot of the french navy was destroyed by the british and churchill ordered that uh and so but some of them some of the ships survived because they came across early on at dunkirk uh we're back to that opening scene again here with goldfinger <laughs> Get through. yep he's about to see this <laughs> oh, oh, all of a sudden, <laughs> I thought he was going to take his clothes off there. <laughs> <laughs> he was thinking about it. Yeah, the shelling begins. What is he even doing? Oh, he's just going out to man the uh, little. He's delivering coffee. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. In the in the first scene of the film, it's stated he's the he's delivering coffee to the front lines. Yeah. So you've got an excellent, you just passed by a, a dragon's tooth, which were giant concrete abutments that were supposed to help for uh, elim uh, eliminating armor um, maneuverability. They would use those to uh, field armor, uh, force armor into fields of fire for mm -hmm. anti-tank guns. Right, yeah. Something that's film I don't really think it covers is, you know, there was a lot of civilian casualties as well on D-Day. 
because <clears throat> you know these towns were occupied by French people. Uh, so there was a lot of French people died in in the fighting. Uh, I won't say friendly fire because there's no caught such in the thing. Crossfire. Yeah, caught in the crossfire. Um, you don't actually see that in the movie, but there was a heavy, <clears throat> a heavy civilian casualty rate during the fighting. No, uh, Major Pluscott is getting bombarded. So I've got a, I've got a. I've got to credit uh, <laughs> Morg here. Morg is doing uh, Yaleman's work on the uh, in our DMs here. He's uh, relaying us a ton of information. Earlier, we saw the uh, the Free French Commandos, and uh, as the Free French Commandos boarded their LST, they joked with their British counterparts that no return ticket, please. <laughs> exactly. So that's that's kind of the attitude that you have of these guys. The, I mean, these these guys are. They're not the French, the cheese-eating yeah. surrender monkeys that we joke about. <laughs> yeah, I know. If only the, it's if a only different the French, generation of French. But if only the Fifth Army, the French Fifth Army, had all been like that, then there wouldn't have been a Second World War. It would have stopped in France, okay. you know? Well, and that was, that was a failure of French high command. I, I, will never, I will never blame any military defeat on uh, the soldier on the line. Mm. Um, it's usually the command structure. As you're seeing here with the Germans, um, it's the respect. The, there's no, there's always honor amongst soldiers, um, no matter what side. Mm. Uh, it's the failures are always. Important. Well, this is it. I mean, the, the British were as well ill prepared, and thank God for the the you know the English Channel because that gave us the time we needed to learn how to fight this war uh, from the absolute disaster of uh, Dunkirk. Well, actually, it was a miracle. That was miraculous. Um, but, you know, that gave us the time. Um, if we hadn't have been an island, we would have been conquered without a doubt. And now we're seeing the, the very few <laughs> Luftwaffe. Well, who, he's got, you got to understand, too, like uh, the frustration on these guys' part. Again, they've got no serviceable planes. Um, the Luftwaffe is a skeleton of what it was two years ago. Um, the, they have been, again, failed by high command again and again. Oh. And that's where you get this frustration <clears throat> on the part of the, the pilot on yeah. the phone. Something called Omaha Beach is about to happen. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, this is the big one. This is the shitstorm. Yeah, every um, every relative relatives of mine died at this beach. So this is. Uh... I was talking to Morg about this earlier, and the three main things which occurred were there wasn't any significant air attack pr prior to this. The um, German defenses in Omaha were far more than they anticipated, and um, the. The troops weren't supplied with the uh, their armored divisions because they were being dropped off too far out, and the tanks literally sank with the heavy the heavy swell. So these guys were basically left, you know, completely bare without any support. Now we have landing craft approaching the coast. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit ahead of you now. My timestamp is just gone one hour fifty minutes. I just hit one fifty. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we're I hit one fifty now. Yeah. So all night, this guy's been like, "Oh, there's no invasion coming." You're imagining it. Well, but again, no. these these are not these are not thirty year old. Are uh, you know twenty two to thirty year old men? These are thirty five plus sixteen, seventeen year old yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah. That that's There's the actual response. footage there. Yeah, if these are that's actual footage as well, right there with the LSTs or the the Higgins boats going in. Yeah, and there's some like great. Um, no, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, um, if you look at that giant ramp in the front of the Higgins boat, yeah, that's a, that's a giant barrier. It's a giant guard. And uh, yeah. as soon as these men hit, that guard's going to drop, and yeah. those boats become kill zones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, you've got MG forty two is the fire at twelve hundred rounds a minute. You've got boats that not one man ever one man ever set foot off of. Yeah. Because as soon as that ramp dropped, yeah, the guns opened up and you just I mean, if, if you compare the scene to saving private Ryan, you know, the differences in graphic graphic detail, you know. Um I don't think this I don't think the cinematic audience would have been prepared to see that level. I mean, I know that when Private Ryan came around, the veterans were saying, yeah, that's about right. That's what it was like, you know. Um, but in this movie, it's you're not seeing the actual level of graphic violence that w it would well, have been like. You got to understand, too, the, the fire, the fire, and you see, you see snapshots of it with some of what's going on in the scenes here. The fire was so intense coming off the beach that a lot of the the Higgins boats drivers would drop their men off early, and you had men they would drown in the water. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, the, the Americans had the Higgins boat. The British had the LCA, which was um, different design. It was um, not as heavily armored as the as the Higgins were at all. Uh, but very similar, but it was a flat bottom boat um, with oak in the bottom, not oak, sorry, uh, Canadian elm, because it wasn't of metal. <laughs> so, bottom of the boats made out of wood, but not the American ones. The American ones were like armored steel, weren't they? So here you have the, the men are... They're running up. It's low tide. They're running past all the fortifications and defenses, and they're running up to the seawall. And then once they get to the seawall, then they have to get over the seawall. Mm. And the, the seawall is uh, it, it's not any kind of cover because you've got German mortars and German artillery that are zeroed in on it. So you've got artillery being dropped with pinpoint accuracy <coughs> on these men, and they can't, they can't stay here. They just have to get there long enough to organize and figure out how they're going to go up over the wall. Yeah, and you didn't have the the troops on this beach had no artillery. They had no Shermans. Uh, you know, they had nothing. Um, no, all the all, all, very few of the double D Shermans ever made it to shore. The amphibious uh, Shermans. Um, you actually have a couple of destroyer captains at Omaha that put their boats at risk and uh, almost beach them to come in and just to provide support for the men because they were so disgusted with uh, the lack what of was happening. the wall was yeah. not in the shape of what they anticipated. Most of the air support failed, um, missed their targets. Most of the artillery failed and uh, they were going up against fresh troops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I was just looking at information on Omaha and it was, it talks about um, the fact that where is it here? There was a couple of, dest of American destroyers took part in the action. Can't find it here, but yeah, there's. It's quite detailed. The. Yeah, so we're hearing on the on the movie there as well. The third waves, third waves failing. Um. The action swaps over to Utah Beach now. Utah was far more successful, wasn't it? Yep, um, there, there was much more, um, much more success with preliminary bombardment, um, and the beach was not nearly as uh, formidable as Omaha. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, the British are taking tea at Gold and Sword right now. <laughs> <laughs> This is Teddy Jr. I'm is sorry. It? Was uh, was gold? Which one did the Canadians hit? They had Juno. 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 Yep. So this is Henry Fonda, Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, with his walking stick. 
he had some sort of rheumatoid arthritis or something like that. Mm. Mm. Kind of a, an analogy to Frost at uh, Arnhem. Mm. Was it Frost, the one with the umbrella? There's a good shot of the carbine. Yeah. <clears throat> the M1 carbine. <clears throat> and then we have uh, Roddy McDowell again. And the guy beside him there is dead. He just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> he got himself two Germans. <laughs> yeah. And the, is he going to say the famous line of uh, let's just start from here or something? I don't know. So as you can see, they, they landed what um, a quarter mile south of where they were supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, where they are supposed to be, yeah. Which might be, again, some form of divine intervention because it, it, it they were able to gain a, a foothold on the beach in a much easier area that was... Um, you know, it was it was a much less defended position. This particular beach, this this section yeah, of the starting beach. the war from right here. Yeah, starting the war from right here. Um, and here we see the scale of this movie. I mean, look at the amount of extras they've got for this yeah. thing. You know, massive scale. No, this, it, this is right up there with uh, Waterloo to me, as far yeah. as the scale at times yeah. of uh, the number of people you see on screen. Yeah, yeah. So there, you, there's a great shot of a non-modified ME 108 <laughs> trainer, two pilot canopy. Um, normally on an ME 109, yeah. uh, it's a single pilot plane. Yeah. The the canopy is fairly large. It offers the uh, the pilot quite yeah. a view, but mm -hmm. the canopy doesn't extend that far back into the fuselage, and so that's mm -hmm. a good clue that it is one of the 108s that mm -hmm. was uh, on loan from Spain <laughs> to film this. And here they are strafing Golden Juno. All well, the Tommy's hitting the deck here. Then you can kind of see there, uh, if you look on the body of the fuselage, you get that bump out around the cockpit. That's another good clue yeah. that these are 108s and not 109s. Again, right there, you can see that extended canopy mm. um, back into the fuselage yeah, that yeah, offers yeah, yeah. that position for the second pilot. Mm. Yep. So now it's 6.53 a.m. Sword Beach. You're seeing, uh, you're now seeing... Um, uh, you're going to see Sean Connery now. Very young Sean Connery. Yeah, playing a, playing an Irishman. It's one of the few times Sean tries to do a different accent. He doesn't do very well. No. <laughs> playing Come Private, Fl Private <laughs> Flanagan if they couldn't find a, a more stereotypical name. <laughs> and these are the Pipers. Now... Initially, before the there's a famous pipe, I forget his name now, uh, who uh, was uh, they 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 basically toyed with the idea and said, No, we don't want the pipe as the pipe because the Germans will shoot them, uh, it'll draw attention, it'll draw fire, and it had the opposite effect apparently. And the guy they interviewed one of the German soldiers and said, Why didn't you shoot the pipe as and with and he said, Well. We just we just thought they were the musicians. Because <laughs> 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 I don't think the Germans really understood the whole Piper thing. Uh, Lord, um, Lord, Lord Levant, Levant, right is there. that until uh, well, and even on D-Day, there was um, there was a lot of uh, if you go back and listen to a lot of the, what the Germans were saying. They didn't shoot uh, medics yeah. early this on. They don't start shooting yeah. medics until like D plus three plus four. Yeah. And what they would do is they would intentionally shoot people to wound, and then they would uh, ambush. They were just like the Japanese would, and then they would ambush um, yeah. for the response. That was it. Was Bill Millen, the famous pipe by Bill Millen. Uh, there's a, a Sherman DD is in the background yeah, of that shot can you there. See that? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The the can like the the thing you see around the skirting that you're seeing around the hull there. And uh, the giant um, U-shaped exhaust, uh, yeah. those that, that was like canvas that came up around yeah. 
so the tank could swim ashore That's and then right, yeah. drop it Inflated. and the turret would be able to uh, yeah. traverse. This is um, Hobart's funny, isn't carrier. it? Hobart's funnies were all the different um, adapted engineered. Uh, so basically, the engineers are being included in the whole regiment. They're part of the regiment. You've got um, Donald Duck tanks, DD tanks, bobbins that laid um, roads, canvas road. Well, yeah, uh, for the for the other vehicles to get across the soft blue clay. You had the crab or flail tank, which had loads of flails on it to get rid of mines and. Uh, scrape up the barbed wire. Uh, no, so actually, the the flails were actually for barbed wire only, and um, they had massive issues with them because of the nature of the flail. They rotated towards the hull, mm. so it actually had instances where they would throw mines back at the tank. Mm. You saw a fascine there as well. That's you know the big bundles of wood that they would chuck down into the um, tank ditches. Damn traitors! Oh, to bridge bridge the tank, the anti tank trenches. Yeah, yeah. Looks like a bishop there in the background with some on the back. Yeah. Oh, here you go. That's um, Kenneth Moore, famous British actor of the time, uh, playing Captain Colin Maud, who was the uh, beach beach commander. And of course, Sean Connery there <laughs> with uh, Norman Rossington. So the main uh, British forces on Salt Beach now uh, meeting up with the commanders. Uh, sorry, commandos. And there's a the local mayor coming to meet them. <laughs> <laughs> the bottle of wine. The mayor of Colville. Yeah, with a bottle of wine, champagne. He was a famous comedy actor of the time, French comedy actor in the 1950s. Ah, sounds like somebody else has unbottled a bottle, un uncorked a bottle there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Peter Lawford doesn't sound much like a Scottish lord, though, does he? No. One of the, one to, of the sorry, go ahead. To remember, that Lord Lavat was also the, uh, the the clan chief of Clan Fraser. Yeah, and still holds that title. <laughs> <He's got laughs> firefighters helmet on. <laughs> If you ask me, Flanagan, there's a lot of very peculiar blokes on this beach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, my favourite of these quirky engineering uh, engineered, you know, versions of Sherman's was the crocodile. It was the flamethrown version, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which you used. There's instances where, like, the German troops in the bunkers would just surrender because just the effect of the noise of the flamethrower. I mean, flamethrowers were later used in other conflicts after this, weren't they? So, yeah, who wants to get their asses burned, burned or crisp? By a yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, mm. I'll, I'll, I'll spend time in the POW game. Yeah. So, here's two Spitfires with the famous uh, op Operation Overlord markings, the black and white stripes. And they're going to strafe these Germans. Oh, yeah, these are those free French pilots. Yeah. And of course, you know, as Huxley was saying earlier as well that there was uh, free Polish, uh, Canadians, uh, Australians, a lot of different nations fighting in the RAF at that time. It's a bit like the first version of the Starfleet. Right. <laughs> so... Major Werner Pluscat or Hans Christian Black. He's having a bad day. Yeah, Black's having a bad day. Two a.m. to go go to the bunker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is. I think these Germans are just being moved around. They're not retreating. They're just moving around. Yeah, they're trying to reinforce the position. They were heading towards the beach, so. 
And this is... Uh, Yes, this is the uh, EU. Uh, this is um, <laughs> German, elitist German officers there living in the lap of luxury. Yeah, that's that's um, that's Rommel. Yeah, I was going to say for a moment there. It reminded me of uh, Donald Tusk or Jean Claude Juncker. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, striking similarities in ideology. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> more more information from Morg here as he's doing uh, some Yeoman's work on the research side. Um, yeah. At Omaha, the level of fire was obscene. One German machine gunner is confirmed uh, at strong point 62 of firing over 12,000 <laughs> rounds of machine gun ammunition that morning. Holy yeah. shit. And then here you have Point de Hoc. Um, you've got that sheer cliff face is what U.S. Rangers are going to scale to eliminate guns that aren't actually there. It's yeah. a terrible yeah. failure of this was, military yeah, this, intelligence. Yeah. It's a hell of an achievement of um, the uh, GI's ability to overcome an obstacle. Yeah, it's Robert. Adapt Martin. and overcome and conquer. Now, two of the actors here, um, I don't know what else they've been in, but Robert Wagner, we all know who he is. Fabian's been in a bunch of stuff. He's a singer, and a uh, he was in a lot of teen heartthrob movies in the 50s and 60s. Right. <clears throat> this is where we see the um, uh, pneumatic... Uh, Grapple guns, Grapple guns yeah, yeah, which yeah. didn't actually work. Um, yeah, Morg said as well. In the second wave, Brigadier General Norman Coda saw uh, getting up the drawers was not possible. Scrap it, scrapped the plan, led the men personally over the shingle, and they just climbed the bluff. So in the movie here, the, these things work quite well. But in reality, they were soaked with water. Like the sound they make when they fire. Yeah. <coughs> this kind of, like, uh, maneuver the American troops would have used in the Pacific uh, theater, wouldn't they? Because a lot of the islands had sheer cliffs at the scale. Yeah, that's that's probably correct. <clears throat> so yeah, they're just getting peppered here from above by the Germans. And this is very much siege warfare, isn't it? It's as you can imagine this as um medieval Yeah, it may as well be a castle wall. Castle, yeah. So they're taking the siege. They're taking the castle by Escalade. Yep. They are the craft of land in there. They are the um, the LCAs. Um, you know the other landing craft. Right. The reason, that, well, the 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 LCAs were designed to be silent of like twenty five yards, so you couldn't actually hear them. They were. A couple of Ford Ford engines, Ford V8 engines. Um, so it was more like a stealth uh, craft, watercraft. You, you had some good sights there of the uh, the German potato masher grenades being thrown. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that guy's got a Thompson throwing some 45 mm -hmm. ACP up against mm -hmm. the Krauts. So this was the attack that was called off. Is that right? No, but I mean, by this point, uh, by the point of your hawk point, Ike wanted to call it off um, mm -hmm. based off the reports that he was getting things were going on the beaches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he wanted to call off the third wave at one point. Um, he pondered on it, and they pushed through. But um, the, just the, the level of devastation of the first wave at uh, several of the beaches was... But you got to understand, you've got... 250,000 men 
involved in this, right? And mm. Essentially, they, they lost a battalion, two battalions mm. of men in this process. It's, it's an insane amount of, it's, it's unfathomable. I, if, if in one day of conflict in modern America, we mm. lost that many men, mm. there, there would be people screaming in the streets to stop fighting, despite the evil of the enemy. Look at look at the response on just having a, you know, <clears throat> going back to when uh, the siege the siege of Fallujah and just some of the the casualty counts that came back from that that were in the twenties and thirties, which is still terrible, yeah. and yeah. Uh, the response to that and society couldn't handle the level of no. loss that you're talking about here. Yeah, well, you think of the difference between, <clears throat> you know, how. Uh, Gulf War, the Gulf, well, Gulf War One, uh, and how the people who, you know, the generals, the the military, the intelligence, etc., were using the media as part of that, rather than rather than yeah, allowing the are. media to work against them. So, so the situation here where you're trying to attack a a German pillbox. I mean, it's it's basically a, a, another small siege. You're going up against a tiny little castle. They've got a very good defensive position. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to shoot that little slit to get exactly where the guy's at. So. Yeah. Yep. It's a hell of a thing. Need grenades. Yep. The the point du Hoc strong point was hit by over ten kilotons of high explosive. It, it was hit with just as many shells, uh, equivalent of weight of explosives, as what hit Hiroshima with one atomic bomb. Mm. And it was still almost fully intact when the Rangers took it. Mm -hmm. That gives you an idea of how well entrenched they were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the time the Rangers actually secured the site... The guns, the 155s that were there, were uh, revealed to be nothing more than basically large logs painted black. Yeah. And the actual guns had been moved. So this was an instance where the German forces had fooled the Allied forces into thinking that that was a, a viable target. There's just uh, there's some great sweeping shots like this one throughout this film. Yeah, that are uh, some are some are cinematography and some are actual yeah, footage. Actual footage, yeah. Well, the it, it does it gives you an idea of the scale of the of the bombing as well as the invasion. And you get an idea of how it was just onwards, 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 you know, until right, you either collapse right. or the fighting stops. Yeah, these guys aren't going to get sleep for the next few days. Yeah. And then only even then just getting, a, you know, a nap here and there. So it's go, go, yeah. go. So yeah, this is the the final gun that need to capture, and as Aldous was saying, it's uh, it's not it's not a real target. Telephone poles, yeah. Yeah, they they uh, they used to do that during the Civil War. They used to call them those uh, Quaker guns. Quaker guns. They should call them Quaker guns <laughs> in the Civil War. Oh, man. There we go. So. There's a good shot of a guy with a BAR. Yeah. And the BAR was, uh, was actually truly feared for its firepower. But uh, quickly after uh, contact with American forces, the Germans learned that the BAR was limited by one major factor, which was the fact that it was clip-fed, mm. magazine-fed, and um, could only could lay down devastating fire, but only right. for a short period of time before it had to be reloaded. And yeah. BAR gunners had a very short lifespan. Yeah. So uh, have either of you ever fired any of these guns? 
Yes, I've, I've my yes, I've, I've fired I've fired everything but an M3 grease gun. Mm. So what's the accuracy like on them? Uh, well, looking at all uh, the types of uh, Thompson, yeah. there is no such thing as accuracy. You're throwing <laughs> just a massive lead down. M1 Garand is, is pretty goddamn um, accurate. Yeah, M1 Garand. Yeah, I, uh, my, I use I use I uh, use I use a Garand for my deer hunting rifle. I go deer hunting, and um, I I have a like my rabbit gun is my carbine, my M1 carbine. Yeah. Before all my weapons were lost in a tragic boating accident. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, my my dad used to have a uh, reproduction. Uh, yeah. Some some out of reproduction of a uh, BAR that I never once fired. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other big drawback on those things is so, so goddamn heavy. So we've got to the point now where Zephyra is finally awakened. And uh, in from his uh, nightly romp with Ava Braun. Uh huh. I think um, nobody's got the balls to call him and <laughs> speak to the Fira. Calls that Bohemian Corporal? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's important to know. This is how he was viewed by the Prussian High Command. He he was not a German. He's an Austrian. He's not mm. he's not part of the Prussian history of mm. um, military accomplishment. He's not high society. He was not looked at as a, a fondly, and that again mm. unified. Unified, des unified towards a, a, a goal versus mm. politics. It's the it's a constant theme that plays mm. um, throughout this. Mm. So we're back to um, Major General Howard now. And this is uh, the Pegasus Bridges. So they're holding the bridges. And Howard here. Wouldn't, uh, Howard, Howard did great work here. I was just going to say Howard did excellent work here. Well, there's what, various what stories. He, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, just saying he did, he just did really good work um, securing the bridge and how he he, he did the layered defense um, for light infantry to hold a position like this in the face of the, the response was impressive. Mm. There's, and there is countless stories like this of, of uh, holding positions against great odds, like the French uh, commander unit who took Oesterum, uh, against massive defences. So this is what never happened at Arnhem. The, uh, <laughs> you know, this just didn't happen at Arnhem. Um, and so there you go. It worked this time round. Didn't work in Arnhem. <laughs> it's a great shot with them running across mm, the field with the artillery yeah. handing around them. But it's great that they're actually able to use the actual. This is the actual Pegasus Bridge. Uh, that well, no, and uh, earlier in the Point du Hoc scene, um, some of those men that you saw mm -hmm. climbing around with the actors were actual army veterans that did climb Point du Hoc. Yeah, there's a great photograph um, that came out on social media around D-Day, and it was um, uh, it was a you know a a 1944 GI standing at the top of the hill, stop top of the cliff, holding his hand out to help a modern day GI up to the top of the hill. So it was like split in half <laughs> the photograph. So it was a nice tour, right. you know. I don't know what well, other gonna, messages it gives. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to share a little little personal line, and that's uh, last weekend I got to celebrate the 102nd birthday of my wife's grandfather who was a world war ii vet and uh today i got to celebrate uh, a really good friend of mine who uh, served in the u.s army um his son's first birthday so it's pretty oh, wild yeah. that in seven days i had a uh, hundred and one years <laughs> different birthdays yeah. uh, celebrated but um Please. you know it's uh it's one of those things where you know, just uh, talking to my wife's grandfather, who's, like I guess, at 102 and served in World War II. He served in yeah. the Pacific Theater uh, yeah, as yeah, uh, yeah. Army Air Corps building uh, airstrips. 
uh, just some of the stories. Uh, different different land, different different era, different people, um, salt of the earth. Mm. Just they did what they had to do, and uh, yeah. in between the pink and purple and blue haired people that I saw today at my mm. friend's uh, son's birthday party. I just, uh, it, it's hard not to reflect when you have that kind of a, a delta between seven days of yeah. where are we at today versus this generation that we're watching a, a cinematography, a Hollywood film of that's celebrating. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it sits there in the back of my mind. Yeah. Cause he's, a lot of these GIs were, were 18, 90 year olds. And today's 18, 90 year olds cry because you've misgendered them. <laughs> something like that or the, their coffee's cold or whatever i don't know um and it puts in perspective that you know <clears throat> in this era uh people were prepared to risk their lives for freedom uh and you know the society we live in now absolutely just doesn't have a clue if this conflict was to arise again I doubt whether you would have anybody volunteering to fight for America. And likewise with Britain, I don't know how many people would step forward and fight for Britain. Hopefully you would, there's still more patriots in America than there is in Britain. So for anybody watching the timestamp we're at now is um, we're coming with two hours, 22 minutes and uh, 25 seconds. Yeah, Morg said as well the uh, the Rangers for, uh, found the 155 inland later with piles of ammo and no Germans around. Thankfully, those weren't turned on the beaches, but were close enough to do so. Uh, so it could have been really unfortunate. So these two here, this is uh, Brigadier General Edwin Park, P. Parker Jr. and Major General Robert Haynes. Major General Robert Haynes, what the hell did he do? Let's see. Well, the, they just made a reference to the 21st. The, the 21st uh, Panzer Division is the one that you've got uh, local, yeah. localized command that's organizing responses and is mobilizing them, despite the yeah. fact that high command has not told them to. And again, every officer yeah. from the German uh, army that is involved in that gets shipped to Finland. And I'm going to, this is, just watch this scene that's going to unfold. This is the one of the most breathtaking scenes of the movie. This is a one-shot aerial shot which follows the free French commanders. This is Kiefer's commandos. Watch this shot all the way through. We're seeing this is the actual town of Wisterham and we're following the commandos as they progress all the way around the harbour. So the French troops have just gone past the German checkpoint and they're heading towards the bridge at the mouth of the harbor. Well, as, as you watch them go down the street, you guys peel off and go into buildings, which is uh, correct tactically. They're going, the main force is going to secure the primary objective. Everybody else is going to go peel off and the fire teams into side buildings to secure them so that they're not uh, caught in a crossfire. You've got teams that move up into hard point positions and then supply covering fire. It's it's a, just an excellent, well shot out sequence. Yeah, and the shot over the over the channel here is excellent with the little footbridge. Yeah, and there was heavy, heavy resistance here. That this is a very well defended town, and this gun up on the top of the the uh, hotel building here, you're going to see this thing is huge. This is is this uh, another one of those. 
what were you calling them early Aldous? This is uh, the, it looks like just an MG42 nest. This is I mean that would rip you apart if you got hit by that. And there's the dragon's teeth are shouting behind. I mean listen to the sound of it. Good god. Oh no, that's a uh, that looks like that's a 20 a, millimeter. I was going to say that looks like an anti-tank weapon, not. No, that would be an anti-aircraft weapon that's just right. being turned down under the troops, yeah. Probably a, a flak 20 or a flak 38. More likely a flak 20 based off its size. <clears throat> that is an anti-tank gun. Yeah. So this was a, one of the most heavily defended uh, parts of the uh, Normandy coast. But it had to be taken. It was an objective. Um, now, the information on Kiefer's... Morg, if you can get us information on Kiefer's commandos. Uh, There's a really good shot of a Bren gunner. Yep. Yeah, that's... Yeah, and a, a Bren gun was uh, essentially the squad level medium machine gun that was issued. Um, tactically, it was not very effective. Um, yep. It had massive issues because of its gravity feed banana clip style. Mm. Um, its bolt had problems. Um, mm. it, it was not well regarded by many, but um, it, it served its it served its role. Yeah. Now these uh, French commandos did the impossible in uh, in Wiesterum. Uh, they were called Beret Vert, Green Berets. And this is all part of sword, the sword uh, beach attack. Um, the unit suffered 21 killed, 93 wounded. Kiefer himself was almost immediately wounded twice. As soon as the attack began, hit by shrapnel in the leg, refused evacuation for two days. Uh, along with two of his men, he was among the first members of the Free French Forces to enter Paris. Yep, yeah, and along with de Gaulle. So this, yeah, this is this, a different generation of French. Yeah, this is, they, they all secured probably one of the most significant victories on D-Day. Heavy casualties. But this is the mentality. They were determined to take their country back. But today we're not meant to believe in our countries. We're not <clears throat> meant to believe in any nationality. Right, these men are nationalists. They're fighting for they're fighting for their land. They're fighting for what it means to be French. Exactly. Here's a good shot of a Piat. Yeah. So a Piat. The Nerf anti tank gun of World War Two. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so that's a grenade launching gun is that correct it's a giant compressed spring that fires a shaped charge mm -hmm. it's really quiet though which um, <clears throat> as much as Piat is derided <laughs> for its very nature um, the silence mm -hmm. um, you could fire Piat from a concealed mm -hmm. position and not reveal your position mm -hmm. which was not possible with a bazooka or a rifled grenade so Piat did have a, uh, a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. So the nuns are just walking straight through the fight here. And that's pretty risky because I honestly believe... Is this it, historically accurate? I'm not sure whether this actually happened. Um, and I'm not sure whether the Germans wouldn't just shoot them, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, so Morg is, uh, oh man, I, I don't know how, I, there is no allied commander that I love finding out details about more than Montgomery, but <laughs> Morg just dug up that 
Intel, uh, British Intel had warned Montgomery that the 21st Panzer Division was in the area, but Montgomery's headquarters unit decided not to tell the men that the 21st Panzers near were Khan. near Khan. Howard's men were not issued adequate AT weapons as a result. Plan that the plan was never adjusted, and the reason was given that it was too late to adjust the plan. So, really, what D Day is, is it's even worse based off of that. <laughs> D Day justifies every decision to his uh, own incompetence of Montgomery's failure in Market Garden. Now, is this a Sherman that we're seeing here? It's hard to say. Uh, the bear, if it is a Sherman, and it's June of '44, and we're in this realm, and we're on D-Day, uh, no tank with a break with like break like that would be in the. I don't think would be on the beach or be it's in the. It's a DD. Town. It's a DD tank. I don't know how Unless they got it's the got scene skirt. There. If it's an, yeah. if it's a if it's a if it's a double D Sherman, then maybe. Yeah. But I didn't yeah. think any of them had brakes like that on their muzzle. But that also could just be Hollywood light. Yeah, yeah. So the, the commandos have had a break here. They've had artillery support, thank God, for once. <laughs> Germans have surrendered. <laughs> There's a monument to keep us commandos in modern-day Wistrom, uh, as you would expect. So now we're back with uh, Major General Max Pemsel. The British troops have a beachhead here. They are moving inland. The initial progress from Sword was good, but um, when the uh, British uh, Sherman Division started encountering uh, German tanks, it slowed right down. But it wasn't until the end of June, wasn't it, before they actually managed to capture Khan? Yeah, once uh, once organized resistance started, uh, inward mobility, inward progress really uh, stalled. Yeah. Probably. But you also have the you're in the Bocage, you're in Normandy, so you've got the Bocage. Mm. And um, unless you've ever been to France, I mean, you can read all the descriptions you want until mm. you see what Bocage is. You don't mm. understand what it is. Mm. It's you know ten feet thick of shrubs and rocks yeah. and earthen mounds. And you, it, yeah, it's just dang, it's thick. It's, it's it's briars. It's it's these massive hedgerows yeah, yeah. and hills that are um, just absurd. It's yeah. amazing what they accomplished. And you'd fight hedgerow to hedgerow, mm. going through fields mm. that are you know half acre to an acre size, and, uh, and behind then, every hedgerow is another machine gun nest, another anti tank yeah. gun nest, another fire. Mm. Yeah, I remember seeing years and years ago there was a really well made series called The World at War, um, yeah. and um, I remember watching that as a kid, and watching the actual footage of that really slow. At, War of attrition through through that landscape, uh, you know, in the immediate weeks after D Day, and of course the there's, Germans... a, there's a great. Sorry, go ahead. That's a great cinematic moment. He stands up, he puts the cigar in his mouth, takes a couple steps, ducks down. There's an explosion. Looks back and puts the cigar right back in his mouth. Mm. That's. Uh... You would never take your helmet off. <laughs> so don't take your helmet off. <laughs> well, also most of the guys do not have their chin straps done. That would not most of, everybody would have their chin straps on. Um, everybody would be wearing their brain bucket. Yeah, because it looks cooler to have your straps undone. You see on cinema, it's, it's <laughs> always cooler to have your chin strap undone. <laughs> I very rarely took face-offs in hockey, but yeah, it, yeah, you would even a ref would give you shit if you left your chin strap yeah. off in, in just a hockey game, let alone a yeah. combat zone. Yeah. And so this is still Omaha Beach that we're looking at right now. So we've got, um, I'm at two hours, 35, 20 seconds. I'm there now too. 
Yep. So, yep. Uh, right there. We're formulating a plan to break out of Omaha Beach. We're going to hit the uh, uh, a weak point in the wall with Bangalore torpedoes and make an opening. And, uh, yeah, so it's important if you don't understand what a Bangalore torpedo is, it's uh, it's essentially a shaped charge um, in a long cylinder. And um, they, they can be connected together, and combat engineers would use them to like blow apart barbed wire or obstacles. Um, they're... They would be connected together, and then you could, you know, set one off and set a whole line off. So it could clear a, a wide area very quickly. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. And it was effective for minefields. Is that right? Yeah, you use them for minefields, for barbed wire, for tank obstacles. Um, but they could, like I said, it's just it's these long cylinders that you connect together, and um, they were, I believe, they were a British invention. Yeah. Well, going back to. Hobart's funnies. Little quick thing about um, Major Percy Hobart. He was a, a tank commander um, who couldn't be bothered with the politics of the British Army and left in 1940. <laughs> he was quite a successful. He was. He had a great relationship with his men, but he left in 1940 because he couldn't be bothered with the politics anymore. Um, he, he was languishing as a corporal in the Chipping Hamden Home Guard when <laughs> Churchill found him and immediately demanded that he rejoin uh, Fighter Command. And he came up with all these different um, engineering ideas um, called his funnies. Now, I'm not sure whether he was involved in the Bangalore, but I'm pretty sure that he would have had something to do with it but because he was involved with all of the engineering um that was used in D-Day on which, the uh, British side, anyway. Which uh, which Home Guard regiment was he with again? Uh, Chipping Hamden. Chipping Hamden <laughs> Home Guard. <laughs> he was a corporal. Damn. <laughs> so this is a bloke he used to be like, and he went on to be quite a prominent. Uh, you know, uh, his I think it was the 79th Artillery. Sorry, seven, yeah, 79th Armored Division, and his armored division. You know, went all the way up to um, up to Germany, and uh, quite quite a feat of uh, achievement for a guy who had been in the Home Guard. <laughs> and here we've got red buttons has survived, Private John Steele. Ding dong! <laughs> God sakes! <laughs> So, this is a famous scene with John Wayne being pushed around on a, I think it's a, is it a cart or something? It's like a little ammo cart. Yeah. And the, the look of uh, remorse on his face there because of what... Uh, Yeah, so this is uh, where they finally got to achieve one of their objectives and reach the town of Samarglis. Uh, just goes to show you how much the uh, lack of information was was at the time and how mm. chaotic it was. Mm. They don't even know if the the landings took place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm well, getting confused too. Sorry, if, you, go ahead. Uh, if you look at the shoulder, um, the shoulder insignia of a lot of the men here, you've got glider guys, you've got 82nd Airborne paratroopers, you've got 101st. It's uh, again. It's just a total mess. Ev everybody is in ad hoc units, mm. and the colonel's doing his best to just try to struggle and get everybody organized and on the, on the same page for what they're doing. And then there's the uh, the grand weapon of uh, the Allied force, the M1 Garand. Mm. Oh yes. Oh wow. <laughs> and off they go. 
for more for more horrific battles to follow, including a big one called the well, Bulge. These, uh, the men that you're seeing here are the 82nd and the 101st. They uh, they're going to go on from this. They're going to get relieved. They're going to get resupplied and re-equipped. Then they're mm -hmm. then you have Operation Market Garden where they jump again, and uh, and then it's on to the bulge guys, after that. Yeah, they couldn't catch a break, and uh, mm. you know they, they get put in what was supposed to be a quiet sector, and mm. then uh, in Christmas, the, yeah, this right year, in the middle of the shitstorm. They're there. right in the middle of yeah. uh, one of the greatest battles of the European theater for the Western Front, and that's the Battle of the Ball. Mm. Undersupplied, under-equipped, not prepared for the conditions, and uh, the Allied yeah. commander to the German commander, nuts. Yeah, and the Germans didn't understand what that meant. <laughs> so we're back now. I think we're back at... Um, this is Omaha. This is Omaha again. Uh, here we go. They're assembling the, uh, the Bangalore. Yep. So there's your uh, there's your tubes. <clears throat> good good shot of them being assembled and connected. Oh, he's just gained a field commission there. A uh, little little. I, I'm having twinges of sharpie, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Get, battlefield get. promotion. <laughs> Get that Napoleon Eagle. <laughs> whatever you whatever you do, get the Eagle. <laughs> well that was uh not to derail from the conversation. He got uh he got his lieutenancy by saving Wellington, he got his captaincy by getting the Eagle, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Yeah, Sean Bean, who's famous for his role as uh, Sharp, where he would often say these words, you're all a bunch of bloody bastards, <laughs> or, or that kind of thing. But, but you're my bastards. <laughs> Chosen men. <laughs> Chosen <laughs> by who? Is there someone you can stream that on? Uh, is there oh, yeah, yeah, we could do that if you want. No, yeah. Carl, Carl. Carl I've been trying Carl. to find it. You don't stream it. You go to Amazon and you buy the entire collection because it's worth every penny. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. The only, I think, uh, I think the last one was the the weakest of the series, honestly. But yeah, I mean, the part of the problem with that was that, that story was originally a, the prequel to the the. Um, uh, the campaign, the Peninsula campaign. It was because it, yeah. it originally was in India before before Spain. So here we see the GIs assembling the um, the Bangalore torpedo. So they're looking to blow. They're looking to blow a hole in the barbed wire. Looking to gain a path of entrance up. And this was a problem that was faced at many beaches. Was um, yeah. they they. Because of how they landed, um, much like the paratroopers not landing on target, a lot of the uh, landing craft didn't land on target. So you had mm. units that were separated mm. and uh, equipment was not available. Mm. And uh, most of your troops did not have Bangalore's. They were relying upon the combat engineers, yeah. and the combat engineers landed everywhere. Yeah. So it was just, again, total disorganization. It was a total mess. Yeah. I mean, the successes of D.D. are all down to engine. Well, the bravery of the men, obviously, absolute bravery of the men, but also engineering, engineering successes as well. Because, you know, like the Higgins boat, the gliders, the, um, you know, the stuff that came up with to overcome the obstacles that they would have. So. So now they've got a hole in the wall. There's a hole in the wire. They've got a they've got a path of egress to mm -hmm. the beach. So here we go, and that gives you an idea of the scale, the amount of people you've got on the beach there. Now they're going to be setting the satchel charges underneath. Yeah. Oh, 
in the, I think this is the, if I remember rightly, this is the instance where I'm sure that guy, that German, that uh, German soldier threw a grenade there. So the packing full of charges to blow a hole. And we've got Black Russian Bot in the chat there. Hey, Black Russian Bot. I should also say hello to Jay Potts as well, who's been in the chat for a while. I don't know whether I did. I responded in text, but um, give a shout out to Jay Potts as well. So, yeah, so Jeffrey Hunter, the actor playing Sergeant or Lieutenant John H. Fuller has, you know, paid the ultimate price. But somebody else has stepped up, taken the charge, and there we have a breach. There we are. At this point, Robert Mitchum really should say, once more, cut to the breach, dear friend, <laughs> once more. Well, you know, is there is there really any difference, though, between uh, the forlorn hope and what these men are doing? It's uh, it's not too different, really, from those moments. It's um, This was definitely, I mean, if anything was a forlorn hope in the in, on D-Day, it was Omaha Beach. So you see the you see the level of sacrifice that's uh, yeah. being done and the amount of people that are dying. It's yeah, and that scene there that's an incredible scene. There we go, burning the papers. We must burn the papers. <laughs> are you gonna burn all the intelligence as you uh, relocate your? Uh, that would probably be a core core level or a divisional level headquarter. Yeah. We must I love uh, my subtitles are hilarious too because it comes in it's like <laughs> speaking German. Yeah. <laughs> we must leave. The main highway has been blocked. <laughs> also, do you like my full on full leather jacket coat? Long coat. Yes, we all like the leather. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the little bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, where, where's where's the glove? <laughs> uh, well, I do have it on, um, based off the production notes, and um, I, I did quite a bit of research on this. All of those rabbits were actually called, uh, fed transcripts of the script of the show uh, prior to uh, That's a nice motorbike there in the foreground. Uh, it'll be a Mercedes or a BMW, I imagine. Like that. Um, this is Private Dutch Schultz, and this is upcoming. This scene upcoming here is one of the the, the best scenes in the movie uh, because it's you know a dialogue between. Again, we're back to the microcosm again. We've got we're seeing the big macrocosm of the of the the whole thing, the the invasion, the the, the fighting on Omaha Beach. Now we're back down to the small scale again. Yeah, the, the climax of the film was uh, busting through the wall. Now we're on the downslide. Mm. And this is where you get a, a conversation between Schultz and someone else, and you get the, the sort of retrospective and the overall, like, philosophy. And there he is, Richard Burton. <laughs> <laughs> Flying Officer David Campbell. Yeah, Wales. Wales has turned out some really fine actors over the years. Um, Burton's the most famous of the lot, though. Well, he was he was filming uh, uh, Cleopatra at the same time too, wasn't he? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Before he was an actor, he was a miner as well. Just like so you know. 
Yes, as all Welshmen are, because that's the only job that the Brits allow them to do. Yeah, a bit like a bit like the Geordies in the Northeast as well, Hooks. <laughs> it was the same situation <laughs> here. That was almost everybody in the Northeast was a minor. Uh, I mean, my wife has told me she, her her grandmother was Welsh. Um, you know, and the stories she tells me from her family history, they were all down the mine. You know, men, women, children. Well, and um, you know, as as we watch <clears throat> these uh, this moment, right? This is on June sixth of nineteen forty four, and less than a year on May 9th of nineteen forty five, we have VE Day as the Germans capitulate to the Allies, yeah. and the war ends. And here we come right back to the man to the with boots. the boots on the wrong feet. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Which brings us from the start of the movie, or near the start, to the end. He's got a cut from his crotch to the knee. That sounds yeah. lovely. Ack, ack. <laughs> and the aircraft fire. Yeah. <laughs> He's pinned it together with safety pins. <laughs> Makes me think of um, Kurgan's neck wound. He has oh, yeah. In that. <laughs> it's got to look wonderful. Yep. It's going to leave a scar. Yeah. So have a good, if he survives this thing, he'll have a great story to tell his grandkids. Yeah. Well, he's been shot in the knee, so you yeah. won't be able to, you'll have to have a stick. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And so the GI, <laughs> he's the one who saw the Germans walk straight past him. He's never had a chance to shoot his gun yet. So he lost the, those guys from the 101st, huh? Yeah. There you go. I think that's a, that's a good summation of it, too. Yeah. It's the, the, the German's dead. The Brit is crippled. The Americans lost. Yeah, oh, he doesn't understand. It's kind good. of a it's a pretty great metaphor for the day. Yeah, and then Dutch yeah. Schultz says, "I wonder who won." And when you look at the numbers, it doesn't look good. Uh, the numbers of uh, Allied dead compared to German dead, there's not much difference really. Uh, overall, I think the obviously the the tally for German. Uh, out of out of action. Well, this fire. is a bit of a fallacy too, with uh, the the amount of uh, semi heavy equipment that they've got coming abor abroad the beach on mm. D one. This would not be the case, or D zero. Mm. Um, you wouldn't start seeing this kind of equipment come mm. in until uh, D two, D three. They, they've got yeah, the beaches are a troops. disaster. Yeah, and um, and um, <laughs> they've got to put in the temporary piers. They've got yeah. um, <laughs> you're going to have LSTs. That are yeah teaching themselves <clears throat> mm -hmm. and uh, they've got a clear you've got CBs that are working overtime as soon as beaches are cleared to uh, open pass for these and LSTs were uh, uh, their landing ships for tanks right they they'd actually beach themselves they would go full bore into shore and then drop a ramp and they're huge yeah they're very shallow draft boat yeah so and, uh, there's actually only two left um, that you can go see um, and if anybody gets a chance and you're near one, look up online and go get a chance to look at one. They're, they're glorious pieces of history. Yeah, absolutely. And that is the end of the longest day. day. Yeah. And we're back to the helmet shot, uh, which is a beautiful moment. It's a, uh, it's a singular individual helmet, but it, it speaks to the loss that was done mm. in, uh, in favor of freedom and liberty that Europe has absolutely. squandered Pete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is it. This should be required viewing, you know, in in uh, for school uh, kids. Maybe I don't know, not young kids, but you know, when they're old enough to watch it. Um, I was going to say that Robert Mitchum pulled out a, a nice uh, Bolivar cigar. I recognise the uh, design on the paper. It looked like a Bolivar, um, <laughs> and yeah, you get this fine military positive 
theme tune for the movie coming here, yeah, but then I think it reverts back to the bum 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 after that, which is the um, the, the Morse code for V, the victory signal. Um, just to indicate that you know there was a lot more fighting to come after this. Um, well, this is this is D zero. You know, yeah. all we all we did here was. Uh, all that was accomplished by the Allied force was to accomplish the to a, to attain the beaches. Mm. There's uh, you know, eleven months of fighting left to go, and mm. uh, a lot more men are going to pass, and uh, a lot more lives are going to change. Mm. And it's uh, if if anything, I always like to you know, any war movie shows the terror of war and the the the, the cost of war. Interesting. War is One never the... a positive. Yeah, absolutely. One of the directors was called Ken Anakin. I wonder if George Lucas got the well, answer there. <laughs> Ken Anakin. Because you know he stole everything. <laughs> that is, I just, yeah. Because it was a bit earlier, which I, I forget which it was now, at the time seemed to be reminiscent of uh, a scene in Star Wars. Morris Shaw compose the music well and as you as you look at that helmet um and we reflect we are uh we're three days late for the 75th anniversary but uh 4,414 men confirmed dead on one day mm. so when they talk about the longest day um over 4,000 men gave their lives on that day Absolutely. And, right. and this is, you know, I'm very proud of my country. I know uh, Aldous and Carl are very proud of their country. I'm glad that through divine intervention and the bravery of the soldiers on the ground that we were able to push back and defeat the horror uh, of the Second World War, the horror of Nazi Germany and this is why we're doing this because everybody you know uh, has a story to tell about what their grandfather told them what their great grandfather told them etc everybody knows somebody who has a relative who fought in the war and it's so important that we continue to remember this so Absolutely. to everybody um, before I go Final thoughts, Carl? Uh, no, uh, nothing much. I mean, it was a it was a good film. I mean, it, from what I know, it, it stayed pretty true to the uh, uh, the feel of the uh, average soldier's participation and experiences of the day. So, I mean, I mean, it's not like a, a one of our typical movies where we're going to follow a hero's arc or anything. We're going to this is basically just a documentary movie. Mm -hmm. So it was great and um, well acted. The cinematography was good and uh, the story was enjoyable. So I enjoyed it. Yeah, definitely. I've seen it two dozen times. I enjoyed it every, every time. And, you know, often when we do these streams, um, we're thinking what we're going to say, we're commenting on the movie, and it's hard to follow the movie sometimes while you're talking about it. Uh, but with this movie, it's so impactful that you know it's you're you're right there in the action even though you're talking about different things about the movie it's it's one of those movies where you, you really are stuck to the screen all the way through any last thoughts Aldous? uh you know i'm i'm going to read i'd like to read a little bit of uh what eisenhower said and that's uh, you were about to embark upon the great crusade towards which you have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of liberty loving people everywhere march with you in company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is a well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. 
he will fight savagely. But this is the year, 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. to 41. The United Nations have inflicted upon Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war upon the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept it nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and beseech us the blessings of Almighty God upon his great and noble undertaking. Mm -hmm. Almighty God was with us that day. And let any man that disparaged that God look upon this day as an example of his power and his blessing. Mm, absolutely well said and <clears throat> here we are today 75 years later you know and uh, as an Englishman as a Brit I just want to say thank you to both you and Carl for the the aid and the support and the lives and the sacrifice that your nation gave to defend mine. So um, thank you very much for that. Well, thank you, Pete. That's a, the honor we obviously don't deserve. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, well, as representatives of your nation. Yeah, the the uh, the, the American British alliance is is strong and should remain so. Um, you're our biggest allies in the world and have been at least since the First World War. So. Um, hopefully we can stop, uh, you know, uh, interfering in each other's politics and, uh, uh, just concentrate on our, uh, the friendship up between our countries. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hopefully those, those, the, the ties between our two countries are going to get a lot closer quite soon. Um, and, uh, that, uh, day can't come too quickly. Uh, you know, so, uh, for everybody who watched today, thank you very much. Um, for everybody who came along to watch and also everybody who watched recorded and thank you to my guests, both Carl and Aldous for joining me on this movie, a very, very special movie commemorating a, a very important event in, uh, our shared history. And with that, I'd like to say to everybody, Good night.